listening to Radio Sputnik. Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. Welcome to the mother of all talk shows. Tonight we're talking Trump. Well, he can't talk for himself, can he? The American mainstream media has begun to refuse to cover what he says and social media has banished him into the twilight zone. What could possibly go wrong? Who knows what he's cogitating about this evening? I know that he watches, even sometimes listens to the show on FM in Washington, DC. Let's hope he's listening tonight. We'll be talking about the coronavirus, which continues to cut a swathe through humanity all over the world. Nowhere more so than in the United States and in the United Kingdom. The number of British dead would fill the national stadium. Wembley, the number of New Zealand dead wouldn't even make up the two teams and their substitutes. Just think about that. We'll be talking about Scotland and drugs, the drugs death capital of Europe. My goodness, what a record that is for the Scottish government to defend. We'll be talking to one of the bravest and smartest men ever on this show, the former CIA high-ranking official and whistleblower John Kiriakou. But above all, I suspect, we'll be talking about what happened in Washington, D.C., on Capitol Hill earlier this week. Coup or no coup? And what would the Americans know about coups anyway? It's the mother of all talk shows. It's rock and roll radio with pictures. Fasten your seatbelt for the next three hours. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. This is Radio Sputnik. The U.S. media and the liberal classes are cluck clucking like old hens about the angry, violent protest outside their congressional citadel, the Congress, earlier this week. They said it was a beautiful thing when it was happening in Hong Kong. That's what Nancy Pelosi said, that it was a beautiful sight to see the mob smash in to the Hong Kong legislature and destroy it. It's a beautiful thing when it's happening overseas. It is the worst thing that you could ever imagine when it's happening at home. These kind of coups, these kind of revolutionary moments are what America lives for in other people's countries. Uh, so forgive me if a certain schadenfreude informs my attitude to the events in Washington, D.C. this week. Forgive me if I can't quite accept the narrative that a few hundred maniacs, many of them dressed in fancy dress, really constitutes a revolutionary moment. Forgive me if I ask if any of the political class and their media echo chamber, although maybe it's the other way around, have ever stopped for a moment to wonder why so many Americans are so very angry about the political class that for all time until four years ago misrepresented them. The Tweedledee and Tweedledum the two cheeks of the same backside who governed them for all time. These people thought that there was a moment in which they could be heard and that they could exercise some control over their own lives. It doesn't matter that Trump betrayed them. It doesn't matter that Trump didn't change anything at all. 
It doesn't matter that Trump is a phony, a big fat phony. The point is the conditions that created Donald Trump not only continue to exist, but have been exacerbated over the last couple of months. The number of millions of angry Americans is now at fever pitch and at critical mass. And because I love the United States and its people, I want them to draw the right conclusions from that. I want Joe Biden, President Kamala Harris, Vice President, to seize this moment and satisfy the apparently vengeful desire of millions of Americans for a proper change in their lives. I won't hold my breath on that happening though, if you'll forgive me, because I don't want to expire before you on the screen. We'll be talking to one of America's brightest young journalists and broadcasters, Anya Parampil, former colleague of mine on RT America, about what really happened in Washington, who did what to whom. As I watched the police ushering the demonstrators in, it did occur to me that maybe this was all a setup. Maybe this was all a provocation to justify what comes next. And what comes next may take many forms, but one of its forms is already happening. As you'll see in a short I did for my Mrs. Uh, account, How So Then, later in the show, I'm saying that those of you who regard themselves as on the left or liberal or progressive in any way, who are dancing on the grave of Donald Trump's Twitter account, are useful idiots. You are validating the right of three or four corporations and the people that run them to decide who can speak in this new world of ours. Who can be heard in this new world of ours? Worse than that, do you think it's going to stop at Donald Trump? Do you think it's going to stop at one person to the left of you? Do you think that the very forces which have now extinguished Trump and his top lieutenant's voices from the public square are going to stop there? What, what, what about if it happened to Jeremy Corbyn? What about if it happened to Nigel Farage? Would you cheer one and jeer the other? Don't you see the road that we are now on? Who gave these people the right to banish others from the public square, to censor content of what we have to say, to get big algorithm in to suppress our reach, distort it, twist it, stop it, allow it, stop it again in order to disrupt our broadcasts and what we have to say. If you think that all this ends at Donald Trump's banishment, you're an idiot, too stupid to be watching or listening to this show. You are giving Jack and the owner of, uh, of Facebook and Nick Clegg, for God's sake, in charge of these matters for Facebook. You're giving them the power to decide what you can hear. Even though nobody elected them, nobody can hold them to account, and their power is derived only from the vast wealth that they deploy. We'll be talking about many other things, though, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. We'll be talking about the fact that Scotland is the unenviable champion of drug deaths in all of Europe. Imagine that, small country, beautiful country of Scotland with vast, vast, vast wide open spaces has more drugs deaths than any other place in the whole of Europe. We'll be asking why and we'll be asking what should be done about it and I suppose why it hasn't been done until now. 
which takes me, of course, into the Scottish political sphere. And I'm there. No matter how much I'm abused by the nationalist extremists, you will never silence me. Bigger and better than you have tried to silence me over many years. I fought Tony Blair. I fought the US Senate. I'm not afraid of you. The Brigadoon Brigade, who threatened daily to drive me back down the road to England. You will not succeed in that. We'll be talking to John Kiriakou, one of the brightest, bravest, smartest of all men. He was a leading official in the CIA until he blew the whistle on the torture being carried out by the agency and other US agencies. Paid a high price for it too. I'm glad to say he's with us also this evening. And we'll be talking to him about the situation in Iran. He's a bit of an expert on that part of the world. And I'll be asking him if Donald Trump in the next week might actually cry havoc and unleash the dogs of war in the Persian Gulf just to screw up his successor, Joe Biden, as much as anything else. We'll be talking also to our own Moats medic, Dr. Ranjit Bra, about the coronavirus, which continues to terrify, horrify, and mortify in almost equal measure the people of this country and other countries too. As I said in my introduction, the number of British dead could be fitted into and would fill the national stadium, Wembley Stadium. While in New Zealand, uh, the number of dead people would not provide two teams and the requisite number of substitutes. Now, of course, there are differences between Britain and New Zealand, the density of population and so on. But keep those two numbers Keep those two allusions in your mind because I've got plenty to say to Dr. Brar and I'm sure he to me about the performance of our governments in London and for that matter in Edinburgh. We'll be talking about all these things and we've got a poll running already. Should Donald Trump have been cancelled on social media? A, yes, B, no, get voting, please, on my Twitter account, at George Galloway. This is the mother of all talk shows. Radio Sputnik. Let's play a game and I'll ask you yes or no questions. Ready? Okay, then. Sick and tired of hearing the same old voices on the wireless? Are you looking for an alternative opinion to the mainstream media? Do you have a thing for a Scottish accent? If your answer is no to one or more of these questions, then you need the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Listen, watch, and share the fastest growing political program in the world! of all talk shows join our faculty of legends contributors and callers everyone is welcome now if you've been following me on social media you'll already know that i'm on to what has been a material change of circumstances for twitter which i enjoy uh, and on which i have a massive following if you're not following me please do so at george galloway and the material change of circumstances is this, Twitter hitherto has uh, pretended that it was a tech platform and not a publisher. In other words, that it was merely a notice board and could not be held responsible for the notices that other people put on it. That was always legally dubious to me because most of the accounts on Twitter are anonymous to one degree 
or another. And so if one like me is defamed many times every day on Twitter by overwhelmingly anonymous accounts, we have no address, we have no redress, we have no address with which we can pursue them. We have no redress in the courts because Twitter refuses to divulge to lawyers the identity of the author of the offending article. We're just a tech platform, they say. We have no responsibility for what the people write on our tech platform. But that alibi is now dead because Twitter has turned itself openly into a publisher. A publisher that not only does take responsibility for what is written on its blackboard, but actually intervenes even on the President of the United States. It first started labeling his output as being debatable, questionable, untrue, contested. That's editorializing. That's the actions of an editor. That's the actions of a publisher, not the actions of a tech platform. And then, of course, they made editorial decisions to ban even the President of the United States from their platform. For me and my lawyers, that turns them into publishers. And therefore, publishers who can be sued for the material they are publishing. I don't know if I'll ever be done suing now. My lawyers are keen to get to work on this new set of circumstances. Now, I don't have to find out who the anonymous defamer is. I can go straight to the publisher and sue them instead. You'll be hearing much more about this aspect of things from me in the forthcoming period, in the next days and weeks. Now, all of this came after the extraordinary scenes outside and inside the US Capitol, a building I know well. I had my, my finest hour inside it. I have uh, only fond memories of the US Senate committee rooms. And uh, I don't like uh, mobs. I don't like uh, uh, willful destruction, and therefore I did not like what I was watching on the television, albeit infused with the schadenfreude that I referred to earlier. Because, call me old fashioned, but I was brought up on the old saying that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And I recall what happened in the Ukraine. I recall what happened in Hong Kong. I recall what happened in a hundred places over 50 or 60 years and longer. And the many times, almost times without number, that the United States has instituted, has organized, financed, and even carried out exactly similar circumstances, except usually those circumstances led to a lot more blood than was shed in the capital. But to get from, if you like, uh, the horse's mouth, the bird's eye view, the view from the street of Washington, D.C., we've been lucky enough to secure an interview with the brightest and the best, Anya Parampil, who joins me now. Anya, welcome back on the mother of all talk shows. Wonderful to see you again. Um, the, Thanks for inviting me. The events uh, that the whole world saw and it broke out of the political uh, bubble. Uh, the, the dogs in the street in Britain were talking about what happened in the United States. We haven't seen that kind of thing before. It's had the same kind of shock value in the United States, I'm sure. Can you talk us through how you see that whole thing? It was truly a historic day, George. I was 
watching the events unfold very closely. I didn't go to the Capitol, but my husband, Max Blumenthal, did, as did a friend of ours who was staying with us. I couldn't go, but I, I was tuned in all day to the media, trying to see the ways in which corporate media was reacting and also what members of Congress were saying as events unfolded. And there was a real sense of disbelief. There were members of Congress saying they could never imagine, or reporters from the Hill saying they could never imagine the people storming the Capitol in the way that they did on this past Wednesday. And in some of that characterization, uh, some racism came out in U.S. media. We had Jake Tapper, the CNN anchor, saying this should be scenes from Bogota or Martha Raddatz of ABC saying, I'm not in Kabul, I'm not in Baghdad, but this is so horrible that I'm in Washington, D.C. And so there was definitely a moment when the facade of American exceptionalism, which many in the corporate media somehow still buy into, was shattered. And as you say, people in capitals around the country, I think, especially countries that have been targeted by the empire, by U.S. regime change policy, people in those capitals, friends of mine in Venezuela, for example, were reaching out and saying, wow, this is very similar to the kind of unrest you've unleashed on our country at certain moments. But what I think has been lost in the analysis of the actual events which took place is what exactly played out on Wednesday. And the way I see it, having watched the Trump rally which took place before the march on the Capitol and based on what my my friends who were present for the demonstrations told me, this event was really, I think, the President Trump. President Donald Trump sending a message to the media, to the Democratic establishment, but especially the Republican Party establishment, that he's going to remain a force to be reckoned with as he leaves office. He may not be the president anymore. He's now, con or he won't be in a matter of days. He's now conceded and acknowledged that Biden will take over on January 20th. But what he did was demonstrate to members of Congress, to the media, that he has a large base of support. Remember, he actually grew, his support grew over this, these last four years. He performed better than a lot of people expected during this last election. And so he has this political force that he can still wield. Uh, the theme of the rally in the lead up to the march was really not about Joe Biden and not about Democrats. It was about Republicans. They were the, the Trump uh, team, as well as the crowd, were really not directing their anger at Joe Biden or at Democrats on the Hill. They were there to direct their anger at Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, at Vice President Mike Pence at Republicans, who they saw as traitors. And actually, Trump's son, Don Jr., said during his speech before the, the group marched to the Capitol that Republicans should be afraid that they're going to show up in their backyard. And for the next four years, Trump and his team can easily campaign throughout the country, not only in order to perhaps secure his reelection in 2024, but to elect more Trump-aligned Republicans around the country. The problem with this strategy is that I don't believe the president and his team thought through the steps that they would take after after sending this group to the Capitol. I'm not sure if they even expected the level of violence, of unrest, because Trump is very, he gives these speeches all the time, right? Riling up his crowds and making incendiary remarks and, and nothing happens. But this time, the people were ready to march and and take back what they saw to be a stolen election. And the result completely backfired on Trump. He's isolated within his own cabinet right now, loyalists such as Betsy DeVos, Elaine Chao, Mick Mulvaney, all resigning in days afterwards, even Secretary of State Mike Pompeo 
denouncing events which took place at the Capitol. So while he may have demonstrated a popular force, he further alienated himself within his party and within even his own cabinet. Well, we'll come back to the wider uh, issues that you have brilliantly uh, described, uh, but let's go back to the day itself. Um, what do you think of the theory, conspiracy theory, uh, that the police uh, were deliberately light on the ground, uh, that the police who were on the ground made no effort to stop the crowd entering the capital. I saw uh, police waving people in, stepping aside, allowing them in in a way that would never happen along the road uh, from me here now at the, at the British Parliament. Um, is there an element that there were people in the U.S. state that wanted this to happen? Well, it, it, it certainly is a, major, a a huge question is why the National Guard and other uh, uh, forces weren't deployed. I've seen them deployed for peaceful demonstrations in Washington, D.C. I've 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 covered demonstrations where there was much more uh, sh of a showing in in the streets for people who were not planning on on storming the Capitol while while these some of these groups were speaking openly about plans to do so in days leading up to it and on on online and it is very clear as you say George there's video that makes it obvious police were letting people inside. And there was also a report in Politico which quoted a an officer who was present saying that he saw off-duty officers, police officers, flashing their badges and saying, hey, I'm part of the force, let me in. And, and they were getting in that way. And he kind of made the point, well, if this is what they can get away with when they're not in uniform, imagine what they get away with when they are. But it, it is evident that the the capital was unprepared for for this march but also that that police were collaborating with the pro trump or allowing the pro trump uh, forces to make their way into the capital and and create this this moment this historic breach uh, of 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 the people's house it is <laughs> It's supposed to be. It is supposed to belong to the people, of course. But I think uh, when you have people storming it and setting up nooses outside, claiming they want to string up members of the of the Congress, that's a bit concerning. Um, well, so a bit concerning for sure, uh, especially for those, especially for those inside uh, who who managed to take cover, uh, including the vice president, who seems to now be the subject of most of the ire. Let's go wider then, wide angle lens, Anya. Uh, as you described it, there's no future for Donald Trump in the Republican Party, at least as presently constituted. So if he is going to stick around, he either has to change the Republican Party through primaries, uh, if he's allowed to do that, uh, or, he has to establish a MAGA party, uh, a party of his own. Uh, unless you can think of a third option, uh, what do you think of those two? Which one he'll take? I think he's demonstrated he can very easily implode the Republican Party. <laughs> Shoot, excuse Bless you. Bless me. You. <laughs> Allergies. Um, he's, he's demonstrated that people such as Mitt Romney can't function as part of the party anymore without living in fear of being confronted by Trump supporters, MAGA supporters. Romney was harassed on his way flying to Washington when he was getting on a on a commercial plane. So was Lindsey Graham, another senator, a veteran of the of the party. And so my my major question in the coming days and months is actually how the establishment will react to Trump being out of office. I, I recently interviewed Brian Becker, a uh, host of a, of a program here in the United States, and he, he made the point that 
there are prosecutors around the country who are, have prepared cases against Trump, and they might, after he leaves office, prosecute him for the type of white collar crime that you could prosecute anyone in Washington for. But when it comes to Trump, there's actually a real drive to shut him up in some way. I mean, that's what we saw with Twitter within the within hours of of these uh, of the of the events on the Capitol, Trump's account was completely blocked. They want to muzzle him. They don't want him spending the next four years traveling around the country and holding these rallies, challenging mainstream Republicans. And so it is possible, perhaps, that they would find a way to prosecute him, put him in jail. I'm very curious how far they will go in trying to silence him, because he is a singular, unique figure in U.S. history. He commands his own base. He's not really controlled by by anyone. And now we see the way not only are members of his party denouncing him, members of his cabinet denouncing him, but CEOs, members of the the capitalist class really trying to draw a line between themselves and Donald Trump, even though they were happy with him, not the Democrats, but business elements and members of his party were happy with him for four years when he was giving tax cuts and and increasing spending to the military. Now they're trying to draw a line and separate themselves from him because I think they see him as a unique threat, someone they can't control and someone who does harness this base of popular support. So it'll be interesting times ahead, George. I'm not so encouraged by the developments that have taken place on social media in recent days. I'm very, very bothered by that. And I think it'll only expand. There's talk about Joe Biden passing a domestic terror law. I don't think that will be exclusively used to target Trump supporters, it will certainly, just as with 9-11, be used as an opportunity to expand the security state and surveillance of all of us here in the United States. So we have to remain vigilant and see how, how these events will be used to, to the advantage of our elite. Well, as, as President Kennedy said, those who make peaceful uh, change impossible make violent change inevitable. And this is the dilemma for the power in the U.S. now. You can, uh, you can close Trump's uh, Twitter account, Facebook, Instagram even. You can do all that. Uh, but uh, un unless you're going to kill him, uh, which itself would have very severe uh, consequences, uh, then the, the, the dilemma you have is do we drive these people underground so we can no longer actually even see what they're thinking, what they're saying, what they're doing? Uh, or do we uh, live up to our rhetoric uh, that we are uh, a free country, uh, we believe in freedom of speech, and so on? It's quite a dilemma, actually, for, uh, for the United States. <laughs> It, it is a dilemma. And there's another element here that I think is relevant to your, your quote, your, your invocation of President Kennedy speaking about those who force a violent revolution. I, I see a relationship between the conversation we're having this week about the, the insurrection at the Capitol and the conversation that was happening within the progressive left wing of the Democratic Party recently, which is the debate over force the vote, which you probably followed on Twitter. Sure. There was pressure to force certain members of Congress who label themselves as progressive or socialist to actually force a vote on Medicare for all and reveal who are the frauds within the party, who are the Democrats who will not support expanding health care and giving health care as a human right to the U.S. public in the midst of this global health crisis. And what I was thinking while I was watching the Trump supporters take over the Capitol is what if someone such as Bernie Sanders or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez were brave enough to call on their supporters, people who are 
in need of health care, housing, and basic human rights in this country to occupy the Capitol in a peaceful manner. They don't have to show up and necessarily break windows and, and rampage the way that the group on, on Wednesday did. But I believe millions of people around this country would heed that call because we are in such dire straits. The stock market may be doing well, but people are getting poor. They are suffering here, George. And what we need is a, a peaceful or people's movement that actually reclaims control of the U.S. Congress. And I just maybe want to le end on that thought. Imagine if, 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 if what we saw on Wednesday is possible, but with a group demanding not the overturning of an election, but demanding health care, housing, support while people are forced to stay home and quarantine throughout this pandemic. I think they, they would be unstoppable. I unfortunately don't think anyone in the Congress is brave enough to call for that because they they don't actually want to challenge the, the authority and the corporate leadership of the party. But it's a possibility. It's something I think people should think about. Anya Parampil, thank you so much for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Much obliged uh, to you. The poll, should Donald Trump have been canceled on social media? My goodness, nearly 3,000 of you have voted already. Yes, 23%. Let me know why you think that way. B, no, 77%. Great responses uh, to the poll uh, so far. 3,122 votes in. You've still got about 90 minutes to vote on that one. Um, now, should Trump have been cancelled? Martin Ashfield says, I voted no. Not because I have any love of him or his politics. It just strikes me that it's a political rather than a moral decision. And Nick says, either they act as editors, in which case they should be treated like other media, or they are just a platform, which they claim they are, yet they censor and selectively at that. Either or. You can't have it both ways. And Fortitudine Vincimus says, I'm not a Trump fan, but we set a dangerous precedent if we start banning individuals. We have laws that can be used if a person commits a crime, such as incitement, etc. This cancel culture needs to stop. You win debates with reasoned arguments, not by banning someone. And Chris Kutz says, monopolistic big tech corporations are depriving 75 million Americans of an important line of contact with their president, uh, all on trumped up allegations of incitement. Big tech needs broken up and for fair competition to ensue. Trump left it too late to look at S230. He certainly did. And uh, those who've been encouraging me to uh, start on Parler, well, I guess I left it too late because Parler has now been effectively cancelled, at least on the major uh, platforms. And Woof says it's not for unregulated private businesses to decide who has a voice. That is a slippery slope. The government must ensure social media is not only regulated, but also forced to pay its fair share of taxes. And Peter Harkis says if Twitter were a UK company, Jeremy Corbyn would likely have been cancelled from social media on the grounds of anti-Semitism. People need to think about this and pause their anti-Trump hysteria for a few minutes. Well, Peter, uh, the world, is, and especially the left-wing world, is full of useful idiots who can't see past the end of their nose, who dance on the grave of Donald Trump's Twitter account without giving a moment's thought to who's next whose Twitter account will be cancelled next. Let's hear from Louis in New York. Go ahead, Louis. Hi, George. It's uh, such an honor to speak with you. I'm a real fan of your work. Thank and you, as a recovering liberal, I want to um, <laughs> talk about the American liberal media's continual failure to characterize or understand the Trump phenomenon, in particular with respect to this, la this latest event um, at the Capitol building. The liberal media here in the U.S. will 
continuously tell you that these people are all racists or Proud Boys or neo-Nazis. And while those actors are reprehensible and uh, were certainly quite visible in those events, the crowd was actually remarkably racially and ethnically diverse, much more so than the media narrative would willfully say. Um, it's also reflective of the fact that the Democratic coalition that swept Biden to power was wider, older, wealthier, more suburbanized than either Obama coalition or even Hillary Clinton's 2016 base. Sure. And you only need to look to the example of the woman who was killed, Ashley Babbitt, um, who it has come out on social media through her postings, voted enthusiastically uh, for Barack Obama twice and was unapologetic about those votes. And I think that what you're really seeing as um, finance capital continues to immiserate working people in, in the United States is that the Republican Party um, is becoming the party of the uneducated, uneducated and uh, the people who are separate from the professional classes here in the U.S. And you're seeing Democrats, most of whom are white and educated at uh, high-level universities, really coddling themselves with this notion that um, that they are the protectors of, of racial equality, where whereas they're actually losing quite a bit of vote and support to the Republicans. Yeah, go tell it to the Marines. Tell it to the people of color in all those cities across the United States that are ruled by the Democrats, Democratic mayors, Democratic local legislatures. Uh, it's, uh, it's a claim that doesn't stand up to much attention, does it, Louis? No, it's, it certainly doesn't. And um, I, I just, I, I don't know what to do in particular because, um, you know, I, I have a number of, of white liberal friends here in the States who are c congratulating themselves that they've, you know, voted the racists out of power when they're actually losing a, a, a good share of the vote. Um, and more and more every year, I would suppose. To, yeah, uh, to I think Republic you're right. Well, if we get a better call than yours tonight, Louis, we'll be doing well. Thanks very much for it. Thank now, you, the uh, Julian Assange affair also burst across the scene, and we'll be talking about it in depth later in the show. But here's the short I made on RT about it. The victory for Julian Assange in the High Court in London was a great victory for Julian Assange. It was a very great defeat for the political independence and sovereignty of Britain and for freedom of the press. Although the victory quickly turned to ashes in our mouths, within 48 hours, Julian Assange had been denied bail, returned to Belmarsh Prison, and now struggles through the bitter winter and the coronavirus pandemic in the jail, which has struck down scores of people in his wing of the prison alone. The victory was on one narrow but important count. Judge Barrestar found that Julian Assange's health, particularly his mental health, particularly a predisposition to attempting to commit suicide were he to be extradited to the United States, meant that she had to reject the US application for extradition. We're grateful for small mercies. Anything that keeps Julian out of the clutches of the US injustice system is to be welcomed. But on every other count of the United States indictment against Julian Assange, she found in favor of the Yankees. She decided, despite what it says on the face of the extradition treaty, uh, that political offenses can, in the end, see someone extradited to face them, even though the Home Secretary, at the time, David Blunkett, personally assured me that the words on the front of the extradition treaty meant what they said on the tin, that people accused of political offences could not be extradited to the United States. She decided that the work of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange had not been in the public interest. Although it's difficult to see 
how telling the public what the public's money was being used for, especially when it was being used for entirely illegal, inhuman acts, which cost the lives of millions of people. If that's not in the public interest, it's difficult to find a definition for the public interest. She decided that Julian was more or less guilty of everything except being in such poor health that he might not survive the US justice system journey and might therefore end up committing suicide. As I say, if Julian had been freed on the strength of Judge Barrister's decision, I probably wouldn't be talking to you about it now. I'd have moved on to some of the other big stories that face the world today. But the truth is, the American government's decision to appeal this finding by the most anti-Assange judge you could possibly imagine is pregnant with serious consequences for others in the future. Essentially, what her judgment means is that if you do exactly the things that Julian Assange did, if you are an investigative journalist of the first rank, if you publish material embarrassing to the United States government, you will be extradited to face life imprisonment or maybe even worse, as long as you're fit and healthy to make the journey. If that's not chilling to journalists and publishers in Britain and across the world, it jolly well should be. Julian Assange, in fact, is a hero, a world historic figure, whose name will be remembered long after Judge Barrister's name is long forgotten. Julian Assange should get the Nobel Prize. He should not get punishment. He should get praise. And it's about time the British government asserted its independence from the United States in the way that it has asserted its independence from the European Union. After all, this was supposed to be the year of taking back control. Free Julian Assange. Let him return to the bosom of his family and stand up for journalism for publishing, and for freedom of speech and expression. Have something to say? Do you disagree with George? Then call us now and give us your view. That's where I stand on that. Let me know if you disagree. Uh, your call will be prioritized. Now, not much I can add to what Dr. Ranjit Brar tells us every week about the coronavirus. I can try and put questions to him that you are sending to me, but I think it's best that we listen and pay attention to the Moats Medic, Dr. Ranjit Brar, consultant, physician, and surgeon. Dr. Brar, uh, let's dispense with any uh, formalities. It's, it's really becoming a catastrophe here in Britain, a public health catastrophe, uh, but also an economic catastrophe, hard on the heels of it, one imagines. Uh, the uh, numbers of people dying uh, are now the highest they've been uh, since the beginning, since, uh, since March. Uh, w regularly now, more than a thousand people are dying every day. Tens and tens of thousands are testing positive every day. And from what we hear, especially in London, uh, the, the hospitals are, uh, are buckling and some of them may fall. Give us your overview, please. Thanks, George. Good to be with you. Thanks again for having me back. Uh, but as you say, um, this uh, pandemic and, and Britain's position within that uh, shows no sign currently of abating. It's been the worst week um, for coronavirus in the world and the worst week for coronavirus in our country over the last uh, week, George. We're at the point now where well over 800, getting on for 850,000 people are being test proven positive uh, for coronavirus each day in the world. Uh, and in the UK, we had the highest day on Friday with over 68 
thousand uh, cases of coronavirus in the UK, but that means for the week, if you total it up, there were almost 420,000 new test proven cases. And of course, the ONS um, has higher estimates, which really say probably one in 50. So 2% of the population currently have a coronavirus in the UK. Uh, but there are areas, um, particularly the southeast and the capital, where that's in fact one in 30 or even one in 20. So these are extraordinarily high, high numbers. Uh, one, in, one in 20, you know, essentially uh, will mean uh, that you're talking about 5% uh, of the population uh, who currently have coronavirus. And that's a, there's a huge numbers, and that's having a knock-on effect on, on deaths. As you say, this week we've had over 5,000 deaths each week, each week we talk, it's, it's more. Uh, and on, yes, again on Friday, we had 1,325 deaths in a single day. That's the largest number we've had. Of course, those are deaths within, uh, who have been diagnosed positive within uh, 20 uh, days uh, of having a coronavirus. Uh, but that's, those are extraordinary numbers, and that is the highest rate. Uh, in terms of hospital admissions, they continue to rise. Uh, more and more of our elective uh, activities is on hold. Uh, again, I deal with a field of surgery where there are many emergency admissions that can't be put on hold, but we're doing only the very most urgent cases, and even people with relatively large aneurysms, with relatively ischemic legs and not having their operations, that's reproduced with other conditions throughout um, the NHS, and we will see already before this second peak, we knew that there were 10 million people in the NHS awaiting uh, appointments and procedures. So there's going to be a huge knock-on effect. Um, I saw an article from the London Hospital saying that you know they've expanded their ITU from around 44 beds to approaching 300 beds. Um, a third of the hospitals in the country find themselves half full with patients having coronavirus. A third of the patients in the hospital half full with coronavirus, probably nationally, we're talking about a 40% bed occupancy rate of our entire bed stock. And one hospital uh, in northeast London, the Whittington Hospital, in the particularly hardest hit area, uh, has declared itself to be two thirds full uh, with COVID patients. So if you can imagine that normally at this time of year, we'd be full to capacity, struggling in the absence of this pandemic entirely, you can imagine the knock on effect, that that kind of rate of COVID, that kind of rate of admission, and those kind of, um, numbers of emergency acute admissions are having on the healthcare system, George. And I saw an astounding statistic this morning that 45,000 NHS workers are off sick. Uh, and of course, not in any sense instantly or even easily at all uh, replaceable. It's not like you can ring up the, the job centre and say, uh, send us along uh, some nurses and technicians, doctors and so on. Uh, so you've got unprecedented pressure on the NHS. You've got a huge number of people off sick as a result uh, from the service. And yet, from everything I've seen, uh, the process of vaccination of the NHS staff, which was supposed to be, and quite correctly supposed to be, the number one priority, is not exactly going to plan. I think all of that is true, George. Um, I was speaking to an ambulance, um, uh, uh, well, a paramedic uh, from the ambulance crew uh, today, who was telling me locally uh, in his area of northeast London uh, and Essex, there are up to a third of the staff currently off sick, essentially due to testing positive uh, for coronavirus or isolating um, uh, with symptoms. So yeah, huge uh, numbers of staff are affected, and you're quite right. I mean, a vaccination offers a, a medium term now way out of this, but we're still at, at figures of around 1.2 million vaccinated. That would be only a third of the over 80 year olds, uh, much smaller numbers of the NHS staff. Um, my wife works also in a large teaching hospital in London, and I was only just able to uh, receive a first dose. They've been having to um, stratify the risk even of the staff, the frontline staff, because there simply aren't enough uh, vaccines to go around. Obviously, as more vaccines become available, uh, more will be rolled out. But currently, this is not going to affect in a very palpable and immediate way this current wave. And it really remains the case that only the public health measures on a population-wide level uh, are the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the allowing 
people to isolate once they're, once they're positive and trying to keep them separate from the general population would be effective. But George, we are still not doing this effectively. And while there's some early evidence of a beginning of a plateau uh, in some of the worst hit areas, really, the, no the numbers across the country uh, continue to rise at an alarming rate. I was just going to ask you that. Uh, we've all now locked down, uh, although uh, it's not the lockdown even that we had in March. Uh, footfall is much higher. Uh, travel on the buses and the tubes, the trains is much higher. The number of cars on the roads are much higher. God knows where they're all going because everything is shut. Uh, apart from workers that have no choice but to go to work because for many people, if you don't work, you don't earn and you don't eat. So uh, it's hard to see how this is going to work, but it's plain to me that it isn't working even as well as the half-cocked lockdown that we had back in March and April. I think that's right, George. So particularly the area around Kent, North East London, Essex, um, we had statistics even during the last lockdown, which very palpably showed that the people who were unable to isolate overwhelmingly were those who were frontline care staff, frontline workers, uh, working class um, communities, essentially the in-work working class, who we know have record levels of poverty currently, um, who are simply unable uh, to stop uh, and sit at home even during a lockdown, because to do so threatens the material existence, threatens the food on their table, uh, threatens the health and well-being of their family and children materially without food, clothing, shelter, being able to pay the, house, uh, uh, the, the mortgage, being able to pay gas bills, being able to pay rent. Uh, without satisfying those basic demands, people are not just able to sit pretty and go for a jog every day. They need to go out and engage with the, uh, the business of making a living to make ends meet. And it's you know, been startling to see in America, you talked about the economic situation, that a, a country which a year ago claimed to have virtually zero unemployment um, just had to stop um, uh, its hospitality sector, it seems, and have a brief um, pause in some of its industry to suddenly find it has 70 million uh, unemployed. And 70 million is an enormous figure, and it shows you the levels of uh, insecurity, uh, the levels of low pay in work poverty, which are existing in the most wealthy countries on earth. Uh, very clearly, we come back to this again and again, very clearly at the beginning of this, Dominic Cummings may seem like a figure of the past, he's gone now, but he was the intellectual spirit behind our, our government's response. And very clearly, he outlined the key strategy at the beginning of all this of the government, which was let it run through the community, take it on the chin, as Boris said, um, uh, 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 herd immunity, and if a few people, old people die, so be it. Now, look, they've backpedaled from that in terms of the uh, PR output. But if you look at the actual effect of the policies that our borders were open, uh, that we weren't uh, told to self-isolate, that halfway through this uh, period during the summer, we were all given subsidies to go out, eat out, help out. Really, the herd immunity strategy remains the one which has governed our entire response. And just to intermittently then suddenly call for everyone to stop what they're doing and go home adds to a confusion, a sense of grievance, a sense that this is never going to be over. And it shows the ineffectual nature of the measures we've been taking. And it leaves us all at a loss. It leaves the health care sector looking essentially stupid, feeling helpless, doing our best to cope with the resources we have, but knowing that we are failing in our duty to provide the kind of care we would like to. But how can we, on the basis of a constantly decreased bed base. Let's say it again and again. As the bell is tolling there, uh, let me bring in Helen, who's known, I think, as Hell's Bells on Twitter. How's that for a segue? She's in Halifax. Doctor, if you wouldn't mind uh, hearing her out. Helen, what's your, what's your question for the <laughs> doctor? Thanks. Thanks for the shout out, George. Um, hello, doctor. Thank you for taking my uh, question. Um, my dad's just had the coronavirus vaccine. Um, my mother has been offered it, and she doesn't know whether to have it or not, um, because she's had a bad reaction in the past to the flu jab. Um, so she doesn't have that at all, the flu jab. 
Um, so she's wondering if it's the same thing. You know, she's a bit worried that she'll have a, a bad reaction in the same way. Is, is there a link between the two? Do you think there's, there's, there's the same sort of reaction is possible? Well, uh, let me summarise that uh, for the doctor. Uh, Helen's uh, mother um, is anxious about whether to accept the vaccine she's been offered because she has had a bad reaction in the past to the flu jab. What would your view on that? I know you can't dispense medicine over the airwaves, doctor. I don't want to put you in a difficult situation. But in general, what would your answer be to that kind of question? No problem. Thanks, Hells. Hells, can I just ask if you can hear me, um, what, what was your mother's reaction to the flu jab? Um, actually, I think she was just very poorly with it. Uh, she, I think she passed out and just um, general... She wasn't hospitalised. It wasn't that bad, I don't think. But that's years ago when she had it and she's never had one since. Um... My dad gets it. Mm. Doctor. Yeah, so I think those generalised symptoms of what we would call malaise, fatigue, feeling unwell, even occasionally having a fever, having a swollen arm, those things that we are seeing commonly. Um, and my my parents now have been vaccinated. Um, I've seen a large number of people who have been vaccinated. And overall, the safety profile, as far as I can tell, is good. I still don't know um, what the absolute efficacy will be in the population and whether it will hold up to the studies. And as we know, the, I had some misgivings about the studies in terms of the amount and quality of the data that was published. But overall, it's the best defense that we have. This is the, vi the vaccine that's available. And I wouldn't uh, be overly concerned if that was my um, mother, Hills. I would, I would say, go ahead and have it if she can, if she's been offered it, to take it. Because, uh, you know, at, at that age, the risks of, of, of the virus, the risks of SARS, of, of this severe viral pneumonia, are really awful. And anything that you can do to avoid it, I would. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, crowded show tonight. Thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Uh, record numbers on the poll. Should Trump have been cancelled on social media? Yes, 23%, no, 77%. 3,374 votes in. You can vote right up until 9 o'clock. But I'm late for the news with Jamie Lowe. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Radio Sputnik News. Every adult in the UK will be offered a coronavirus vaccine by the autumn, Health Secretary Mac Hancock has promised. Hancock also did not rule out the strengthening of current restrictions, saying the NHS was under very serious pressure. It comes after almost 60,000 new cases of coronavirus were reported in the UK on Saturday, and the number of deaths after a positive test passed 80,000. A further 508 people who tested positive for coronavirus have died in hospital in England, bringing the total number of confirmed deaths reported in hospitals to 55,580, NHS England has said. Scotland has recorded three deaths of coronavirus patients and 1,877 new cases in the past 24 hours, according to official figures. And Public Health Wales have reported another 45 deaths and 1,660 new cases. In Northern Ireland, 17 more deaths have been reported in the past 24 hours, along with 1,112 new cases. The Health Secretary said he did not want to speculate on whether the government would further strengthen restrictions after warnings from scientists on Saturday that they may need to be stricter. Elsewhere, Germany's death toll from COVID-19 has reached 40,000 and Russia has recorded 22,851 new COVID-19 cases and 456 deaths in the past 24 hours. 
Britain's Home Secretary Priti Patel has said police officers will not hesitate to enforce lockdown rules as she defended the way police have handled breaches. She said rising numbers of coronavirus cases and deaths illustrated the need for strong enforcement. It comes after the National Police Chiefs Council published guidance saying officers should issue fines more quickly when rules are broken. More than 30,000 fines have been handed out by forces in England and Wales. A British nurse who lived in a caravan for nine months to protect her mother from coronavirus says moving back into her house was like winning the lottery. Sarah Link and her husband Gary, who usually share a home with her mother, brought the caravan in March in England's black country to allow them to isolate. They moved back home for Christmas after her mother received the vaccine. The caravan bought for £600 and parked on their own drive in Cradley outside Birmingham allowed Link to continue working at Birmingham's Queen Elizabeth Hospital and her husband at his fishmonger's business. She said that she'd do it again tomorrow. She would have done anything to protect her mum. Black boxes of a passenger plane which crashed into the sea soon after takeoff from Jakarta, Indonesia on Saturday have been located, officials say. A small flotilla of ships has been searching the site and Navy divers are expected to be able to retrieve the two flight recorders from the relatively shallow waters. Aircraft parts and human remains have also been found. The Srivijaya Air Boeing 737 was carrying 62 people when it vanished from radar on its journey to Borneo. A prominent follow of the baseless conspiracy theory QAnon has been charged over the US Capitol riots. Jacob Anthony Chansley, known as Jake Angeli, is in custody on charges including violent entry and disorderly conduct. Chansley, who calls himself the QAnon shaman, is allegedly the man pictured with a painted face, fur hat and horns inside Congress on Wednesday. President Donald Trump faces another impeachment charge for his role in the unrest. Proceedings are expected to begin tomorrow. The US Vice President Mike Pence will attend Democratic President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration, unlike President Trump. If Trump does not attend the ceremony on January 20th, he will be the first president in 150 years not to do so. Biden has said that he would welcome Pence at the swearing-in, but not Trump. When President Donald Trump signed the 2.3 trillion coronavirus relief and government funding bill into law in December, so began the 180-day countdown for US intelligence agencies to tell Congress what they know about UFOs. The Director of National Intelligence and the Secretary of Defense have a little less than six months now to provide the Congressional Intelligence and Armed Services Committees with an unclassified report about unidentified aerial phenomena. It's a stipulation that was tucked into the committee comment section of the Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal year 2021, which was contained in the massive spending bill. That report must contain detailed analyses of UFO data and intelligence collected by the Office of Naval Intelligence, the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force and the FBI, according to the Senate Intelligence Committee's directive. The report should also identify any potential national security threats posed by UFOs and assess whether any of the nation's adversaries could be behind such activity. Electricity is gradually being restored in Pakistan following a huge power cut across the country which led to every city reporting outages. Homes nationwide were suddenly plunged into darkness from about midnight. Power is now back in most cities, but officials warn that it could still be a few hours before electricity is fully restored. The outage is believed to have been caused by a fault at a power station in the south of the country. And finally, and I can't quite believe that I'm about to say this, but Denmark's flagship broadcaster has suffered criticism over its newest children's TV program called John Dillamond, an animation starring a man with a penis so massive and flexible it can save children from danger, fetch objects from a river and operate as, you won't believe this one, a pogo stick. The show, whose 13 episodes are available to watch on the DR Network's website, follows the character as he navigates an array of unexpected scenarios caused by his inexplicably huge genitalia. 
In one episode, Dillerman uses his gigantic stripy organ as a lead for his dog, but quickly finds himself inundated with requests from his neighbours to take their pets out for a walk too. And in another episode, he breaks a friend's vase with his penis. The show's opening montage also shows him using his genitalia to keep away a lion from a group of children. A spokesperson for DR said that most of those who criticised the programme did so without having seen it. She said, in Denmark, it is now a huge success and children are watching it in big numbers. And the jokes just write themselves, don't they? So I'm going to remain professional and leave them to you to come up with. That's the latest here on Sputnik News. I'm Jamie Lowe. <laughs> You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. Now, from 1990 until March of 2004, John Kiriakou was an analyst and later a counter-terrorism operations officer. He served in the CIA. He became chief of counter-terrorist operations in Pakistan, a busy billet, following the September 11 attacks, acting as a senior operations officer. His tour culminated in the March 2002 with the capture of Abu Zubaydah, al-Qaeda's third-ranking official. When he returned from Pakistan, John was named executive assistant to the CIA's Deputy Director for Operations. And in that capacity, John was the principal Iraq briefer for the Director of Central Intelligence. He then became a senior investigator on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee after a brief time in the private sector, where he focused on international terrorism, piracy, and counter-narcotics. Additionally, John served a senior intelligence advisor to the committee's chairman, Senator John Kerry, now back in the government. Following his service on the Hill, John became an intelligence and counter-terrorism consultant and author. Uh, but he's best known as a whistleblower, revealing the truth about the torture policy practiced by his own agency, the CIA, against prisoners in CIA custody. Uh, his latest book is the CIA Insider's Guide to the Iran Crisis, from the CIA coup to the brink of war. He joins me now. John, very good to see you. We've spoken many times in the past, uh, but this is the first time I think we've uh, been face to face, albeit virtually, so I'm deeply grateful for that. Um, let's start at the end. We'll go back to the coup, I promise. But let's start at this end point. Uh, the brink of war, uh, is there a danger in the I, last seven days that Donald Trump will unleash the dogs of war in the Persian Gulf? There is a danger. And that's why the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, consulted with uh, General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, to make sure that there would not be military support in these last uh, seven to 10 days for launching a, a strike against Iran or any other country. You know, when you have a, when you have a president in office who's unhinged, who, who by all accounts is literally out of his mind and wants to take a final shot on his way out, uh, you have to step up and make sure that he is not able to do such a thing. It would be a war crime. It would be a crime against humanity. It would be illegal both in the United States and under international law. And uh, I'm glad that uh, there are elected officials here in the United States who are standing up to say it's not going to happen. Well, uh, the Chinese military is now on uh, red alert. Uh, it is uh, the president told the armed forces to be ready to fight at any second, and the Iranians are in a state of uh, a high alert also. Uh, both countries, one more than the other, of course, but both countries are more than able and willing to strike back against any Trump provocation. 
uh, which means we're, we're, we're sitting on a tinderbox here. However, Trump is the commander-in-chief. What would be the legal justification for the armed forces to refuse orders from him? Yes. Uh, military officers in the United States are compelled by law to refuse to follow what they consider to be an illegal order. Uh, we had the same situation in the CIA. If you believed that the order was illegal, you were compelled to refuse to carry it out. And so that's what we're seeing now. You know, we're seeing resignations of civilian officials at the cabinet level and the sub-cabinet level. We are not seeing senior military officers resigning their commissions, which is a good thing because it's going to be those military officers who will stand up and say no. Uh, there was a, a representative from the Joint Chiefs of Staff less than a week ago who was asked a question by a reporter, what will you do if uh, the president refuses to leave the, the White House on January the 20th? And he said that the president would be treated as any other trespasser in the White House, and he would be arrested and escorted out. We're, we're going to see the same thing among the military, where if the president gives an order to attack any country, Iran, China, Russia, whatever it happens to be, they will refuse that order because they know it's an illegal order. Now, uh, there's a long, long history, as we both know, you better than me, uh, but uh, I know it quite well, too, uh, of, uh, of Western UK, U.S., overthrow of regimes in Iran. Indeed, uh, the current Islamic Republic would not exist if we had not overthrown uh, the democratic left of center government uh, back in 1953 and reinstated the uh, worst tyrant in the Middle East, and there was a lot of competition for that title, the Shah of Persia. Uh, now, uh, we therefore, uh, dropped a pedal, uh, a paddle, uh, a pebble rather, in the, in, in the pool back then in 1953. It became a tidal wave. Um, and, and therefore, the Iranians are right, are they not, to be deeply suspicious, not just about the actions of this president, but of the one that's about to come in. Sure. Sure. They, they have every reason to be concerned. We have been interfering in that country since at least 1953, probably really, if you go back and, and really look at it, since the end of the, of the 19th century, we've been interfering with domestic Iranian affairs. Uh, I have a friend who's a, a noted former journalist by the name of Robert Shear, spent most of his career at the Los Angeles Times, and he interviewed, when he was a young man, he interviewed Kermit Roosevelt, the son of President Theodore Roosevelt, who was the CIA officer in charge of overthrowing the Iranian government in 1953. And Kermit Roosevelt said, that the CIA overthrew the Iranian government for two reasons. Number one was an obsession with communism. And anyone who wasn't an avowed capitalist was considered to be a communist, and communists were bad, and so we had to stop them. But number two, we overthrew that government because the British government asked us to in order to protect British oil. Well, Mohammad Mossadegh was not a communist. He was barely even a socialist and we overthrew a democratically elected government. As you rightly said, George, we are still facing the consequences of that terrible, terrible decision. Kermit Roosevelt, at the end of his life, said that it was the worst mistake he ever made in a 30 plus year at the CIA. He should have left the Iranian government alone. He should have told the, the leadership at the CIA to leave the Iranian government alone. Instead, we've created now generations of hostility with the Iranians, something that we haven't yet been able to get past. And I don't expect, frankly, any change under a President Joe Biden. Uh, remember, during, during the Obama administration, where we did have the Iran nuclear deal, it wasn't such a giant leap forward as the Obama administration wanted us to believe. And now that it's been scrapped, what's Joe Biden going to do? Start back at the beginning again? I'm not sure that I trust him to do that. Can he even uh, do it? Uh, he'd have to get it through the Senate. Right. Uh, 
get it through his own cabinet. And as far as I can see, his own cabinet uh, leaves much to be desired. Uh, but he'd, he'd have to get it through a deadlocked Senate, 50-50 now, uh, membership. Um, I'm not sure he even could without demanding changes to it. And those changes have already been rejected in advance by the Iranians. So That's right. this crisis isn't going away. It's not going away. And, and a bigger problem for him legislatively is that if this is going to be renegotiated, of course, it has to be renegotiated as a treaty. And the U.S. Constitution says that in order for a treaty to be uh, to be passed by the Senate, it has to pass by two thirds majority, which means he would need 67 senators. That would be the entire Democratic contingent plus 17 Republicans. Well, I would be surprised if he could get two Republicans. That actually would surprise me. So I, I don't see any great changes, at least in the near term, coming in our relations with Iran. And of course, there's now an arrest warrant out uh, mm -hmm. on Donald Trump and other American officials for the acknowledged, admitted murder of General Qasem Soleimani. Uh, which uh, took place a year ago, almost exactly. Um, how serious a threat is that? Frankly, it's not that serious a threat. Both Iran and Iraq uh, filed these charges against Donald Trump and several other U.S. Uh, political leaders um, for General Soleimani's assassination. They have filed arrest warrants with Interpol. Um, other countries did the same thing with uh, Dick Cheney when he was uh, when he left the vice presidency and with George W. Bush. They likely just like just like Donald Trump, they likely won't travel to a country that would have the guts to grab him and turn him over. Uh, but I think that it sends a strong political message, at least. Yes, uh, I take your point about uh, about Bush and Cheney. But as it happens, there's a critical mass of enemies uh, arraigned against Donald Trump. It's not yes. actually as impossible as it might on the face of it seem. Well, I, to tell you the truth, I hope you're right. But, uh, but I can't imagine Donald Trump traveling to many countries aside from maybe the UK where he owns a golf course. Uh, I think that he's going to uh, spend most of his time in Florida if they don't throw him out of Florida. Well, they might. And uh, his golf course is not far from where I live, John. So I might go along You're... and try and make a citizen's arrest. That's uh, right. In response to that Interpol order. Good luck with, uh, with the book, The CIA Insider's Guide to the Iran Crisis, From CIA Coup to the Brink of War. That's by Gareth Porter and John Kiriakou. John, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for Thanks. joining us on the mother Thanks. of all talk shows. Now, uh, as I said earlier, um, my missus has an outfit called How So Then? And she prevailed upon me. She couldn't get anyone else at the money that was available to make the following short for How So Then? Take a look at it. A fool and his freedoms are easily parted. The conga line of useful idiots dancing on the grave of Donald Trump's Twitter account stretches right around the world and back again. But what exactly are they celebrating? They're celebrating the right, the ability of three individual, unelected, unaccountable corporate powerhouses to silence any political figure that they like even when that political figure is the elected president of the most powerful country in the world, a man who got 75 million votes in an election just the other day, and who has 85 million followers on Twitter. Although no more, because his Twitter account has been closed, as has his Facebook account as has his Instagram account. So the owners of these three platforms have decided to silence a powerful political figure, whatever you think or I think of that political figure. What's democratic about that? Why are you celebrating that? Because of course, the real lesson of this is that these individuals have taken over the public square and can 
drive anyone they like out of it. And if they can drive out Donald Trump, they can sure drive out you. They can sure drive out me or anybody that they decide has views and is expressing ideas that they, the corporate plutocracy that rules the airwaves, don't like. If you can't see that that is a clear and present danger to public discourse, then you are one of those useful idiots. I despise Donald Trump, but I certainly cannot support his silencing because I'll tell you something, silence Donald Trump, the next Donald Trump will be a far more dangerous individual to deal with. I hope that was all right, Mrs. Galloway. Should Donald Trump have been canceled on social media? Yes, 24% up one, and no, 76% down one. 4,000 people have voted in this poll, and you've still got half an hour to do so at my Twitter account, at George Galloway. Now, a necessarily truncated tour of the seven days in history in which we are now living. On this day, one year ago, two scientists published the entire genetic code of the coronavirus that was soon to wreak havoc all over the world. It marked the start of a year of intense and rapid scientific endeavor to work out how we might fight the virus. We're still working it out, although we're now rolling out the vaccine, at least in the developed world. Professor Yong Zhen Zhang, who was at the Chinese Center for Disease Control in Beijing, sequenced the genome of the virus that closed down the world. Professor Eddie Holmes, based at the University of Sydney, who cooperated with his fellow professor, had the genetic blueprint for the coronavirus in his possession for exactly 52 minutes before he put it online. In this week in 1957, Harold Macmillan accepted the Queen's invitation to become Prime Minister following the sudden resignation of Sir Anthony Eden, who had been broken by the catastrophic decision to invade Egypt a year before. And a year later, in 1958, Jerry Lee Lewis, Great Balls of Fire, reached number one on the UK pop charts. In this week, in 1999, The Sopranos, ah, starring James Gandolfino, uh, Gandolfini as mobster Tony Soprano, debuted on HBO. I think possibly the greatest thing ever on television. This was the week in 1962 when more than 2,000 people were killed in a huge avalanche which engulfed nine villages in Peru. And two years later, in 1964, the first government report by U.S. Surgeon General Luther Terry warned that smoking might be hazardous, only might like. In 1971, two bombs exploded at the Hertfordshire home of the British Tory Employment Secretary, Robert Carr, causing serious damage. They'd been planted by the anarchist group, the Angry Brigade. And it was in this week, in 1991, when the US Congress voted to authorize the use of military force against Iraq to end its occupation of Kuwait. On the 13th of January, 1993, American, British and French fighter jets carried out the first series of bombing raids over southern Iraq itself. And in this week, Dr. Harold Shipman is believed to have killed more than 2,000 patients, was found hanged in his prison cell in 2004. On January 14th in 1969, the legendary Manchester United football manager, Matt Busby, announced he was stepping down to make way for a younger man. And in 1895, in this week, Tchaikovsky's ballet, Swan Lake, premiered in St. Petersburg or Leningrad, as it later became, and St. Petersburg again, as it now is. And in 1973, the US President Richard Nixon ordered a halt to American bombing in North Vietnam, following peace talks in Paris. And in 1922, 
1992, the Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's dozy son, Mark Thatcher, was on his way home after being missing in the Sahara for six days, I remember it well. And on this, uh, in this week, uh, in 1970, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi assumed the role of Prime Minister four months after leading a successful overthrow of the monarchy. And finally, this was the week in 1979 that the Shah of Iran fled the country following months of increasingly violent protests against his regime. Mohammad Reza Pahlavi and his wife Empress Farah left Tehran and flew to Aswan in Egypt, never to return to their country. Let's take a call. Elliot is in Florida on the riots. Go ahead, Elliot. Yes, George, before I lose uh, all my credibility, I uh, wish you uh, uh, um, good tidings in your new uh, new residence in Scotland. You're Thank moved, you. You're in Scotland, right? Thank you. Yes, I have. Yes, Thank I you, have. Elliot. Thank you. All right, now I'll quite close, to, quite I, close uh, to Donald Trump's golf course. Oh, I couldn't figure that out, what you were saying, because I'm not far from his uh, golf course in Florida, you know. Well, there you go. We're, we're brothers from another mother. Go ahead, Elliot. <laughs> I really take issue with um, a lot of what's been said uh, about uh, the canceling of uh, Trump's account and, and the, the accounts that are being made of, of the, the, uh, the crowd uh, and their, their makeup. I think it's out of touch with what's going on, the intensity of what's going on in this country. First of all, Donald Trump has the very pulpit. He, has, he can summon the entire press corps, the White House press corps, if he wants to get his message out. Yeah, but, but they don't, they're no longer media, reporting him, Elliot. Well, CNN, MSNBC, uh, The Washington Post, they've all stopped reporting him. You know that. Well, why is that? He's, he's inciting sedition. Well, the, <laughs> he's the, inciting riots. The, 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 there may well be uh, a reason, and you've just given your reason, but don't say he can summon them when you've just acknowledged that they won't come. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know that. Well, I mean, no, it's still a fact. Being, uh, they, 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 stopped, they stopped reported them, uh, reporting them around the time of the Hunter Biden laptop. You remember that one? Uh, yeah, I, which I was on the opposite side, but I didn't. I thought it was a, uh, a dirty trick. A, uh, oh, anyway, let's not go down that road yet. Well, why um, not? Why the, not go down the, that road? The, uh, you said he had the well, bully because, pulpit. You said he had the bully pulpit because he's the president. As the president, but, he revealed the contents of the son of the Democratic challenger's laptop. It was so lurid and ugly. Yes. Uh, that it was a story yes. in any language, in any country, but they didn't report, report it. Right. They closed it down, Elliot. That's not what he revealed was what, the, what uh, Giuliani and, and um, uh, Roger Stone created. It was not a re really Hunter Biden's laptop. That's the thing. It was what they created, and they made everybody believe it. Well, anyway, uh, these are, uh, it, right? th these are highly tendentious. As they say on Twitter, Elliot, th that claim is disputed. <laughs> I know. But listen, what, what you cannot say in the United States in terms of freedom of speech uh, is you cannot advocate the overthrow of the United States government, whether on Twitter or on your bully pulpit or anywhere else. It's not legal. Where's and the charges? What he is doing... Where, where's the charges? What's that? Where are the charges? The char they're coming. Believe me, they're coming. Really? Uh, they're, they're, stalk they're stalking the Congress. They, they want they're to impeach him talking, on seditious talking, charges. Yeah, talking is cheap, but you know he will not be impeached. You know that the House will impeach him. Well, you know that. Well, you, 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 know, you know that the House will impeach him like they did last time, but the Senate will not. So he will not have the been Senate is impeached. Now the, the Senate will be turning democratic, and they're talking about waiting until a, it does you, you need to impeach two, him. You need a two-thirds majority in the Senate to convict the president uh, in any impeachment hearings. 
And apart from anything yes, else, I'm telling you, there is a, there is a lot of anger in Congress well, right now. There might be, but Trump. you keep changing, you keep moving the goalposts or the go, or, or the golf pin. Uh, you said no, he was going to be impeached. Going to you said he was going to be impeached. You've just conceded he is not going to be impeached. So I'm asking no, you again. No, I'm saying he, I'm, he, 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 he will be impeached. Well, but the I'm Senate, will be, but the Senate will not find him guilty. You know that. So they're where made. are they're the made. charges? Where are the charges? They're, they've already put forth a bill in the House of impeachment on right. sedition charges. There were, there were, um, uh, 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 you know, you Confederate flags being carried. Well, That's a sedition. I, I, well, <laughs> listen, are you telling the audience that Donald Trump is going to be arrested for sedition? Because I'll get you um, back on the I'm show. I'll get you back on the show when it's clear that he is not. Uh, well, well, we'll see. I mean, there is, there are rumors. There is a bill that there has already rumors. been there are rumors. in Congress. Anyway, does it ever occupy no, your mind? Elliot, 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 does it ever cross your mind the question, how come a gorilla, a knuckle-dragging, vulgar gorilla like Donald Trump got 75 million votes in your presidential election. Does that not occupy your mind for a moment? Do you never ask, so yes, do you never ask have, why? Do you never ask yes, why? And it, I, of course I ask why. It has a lot to do with QAnon. It has a lot to do with his Twitter uh, rants and raids, which are based in, not well, based well, in reality. Are, are, you a nation, and, are you a nation of idiots? 75 million yes, people voted yes. for a man Voted for a man yes. because of his Twitter rants. Yes, you hate exactly. the American people, are, Elliot. We don't are you? Nation, George, we Elliot, are Elliot, you, you hate the American people. You think they're stupid. I know they're stupid. I'm American. Okay. Right, that's it. Elliot in Florida <laughs> knows that his own people are stupid. Should Donald Trump have been cancelled? Yes, 24 percent. No, 76 percent. 4,212 votes in. Let's take some more social media. David Young says, I'm not a particular fan of Trump or Biden for that matter. I don't think he should have been cancelled, however, on social media. I've witnessed far more malevolent tweets than his rambling, besides if they pull him then they should also pull the Chinese government, etc. But they won't. And Peter, in the Isle of Wight, says whether folks agreed with them or not, they should be the ones to decide, not the platform. By banning, it will cause far more division and harm. And Jack Stewart says if social media can silence the President of the United States, then they can silence anything. Free speech will soon be a thing of the past. Let's hear from Brian in Fife in Scotland. Go ahead, Brian. Hello there, George. How are you doing? Great. Nice to hear from you. I think I've got a solution to COVID. I have oh. put it to my member of parliament, and he has written to the health secretary. And I have also passed it to my member of Scottish parliament, because in Scotland we have two parliaments, Westminster and Holyrood. Don't I know and it? She she has passed it as well to the Scottish Health Secretary, who's 67 years old, I kid you not, and has not done anything about it yet. But can I tell you the solution? Because Please, the whole world is waiting on your every word. The issue is that people cannot see COVID. Would you accept that? Cannot see it? Yes. It's no, invisible. It's, too, it's too small to see, yeah. Uh then we need to have something, a signalling mechanism that shows people if you have it and are isolating, if you're shielding, if you're vaccinated. A if kind you're of vulnerable. ray gun, a sort of a ray gun that we go no. around pointing at people. This is a controversial thing. Why don't we just have a coloured wristband that's visible to humans? Well, we could put a star on people's uh, tunics. Uh, we could ring you a know, bell like the leper. Well, can I just explain something? Yeah. Right. The people, the Nazis put yellow stars on the Jews, didn't they? Don't I know it, yes. And did everybody hurt the Jews or did some of them help them? 
uh, a tiny number helped them. The rest bundled them onto the cattle trucks and to their extermination. And Schindler? Schindler Did he was, help them? Schindler was so much one man, you know his name. The vast How did majority. He know? The vast, How? because I know this subject like the back of my hand. The vast majority of the people in the occupied countries of Europe were either too scared to do anything to come to the aid of the Jews and others that were being exterminated, or they were actively assisting the Nazis in that extermination. Indeed, but remember, the Nazis lost the war because they hurt the Jews. Well, the they, lost the war, the Jews they lost the war, won. but not before they had killed uh, the best part of 100 million people. I understand that, George, but the, the question is, we've seen 60,000 die in, in Britain mm. because they cannot, 62,000 people every day in Britain mm. do not realise that the person standing next to them has covid Okay. I've heard from nurses, listen to this, I've heard from nurses that say entire families are being infected because uh -huh. when one of them gets infected, the stigma of admitting it is so great that the whole family gets it. But the stigma wouldn't stop them putting on a coloured wristband and walking around with it. Why not? That, I do. I've asked you a question. That, that stigma wouldn't stop them? If, why, they won't admit it? It, if they won't admit it to their own family... Why would they walk around with a coloured wristband saying, I'm a leper, I've got COVID? Because it doesn't say I'm a leper. It says I'm shielding yellow, I'm vaccinated pink, I'm a key worker blue. If we're all wearing coloured bands, the stigma is reduced. At the moment, people with COVID won't tell you you've got it. You know that you're standing against Margaret Ferrier. She had it, she knew she had it, she got on a train and she couldn't show to anybody she had it. How stupid was she? If she had had a band on, people could have taken care of her or helped her. And we couldn't tell. She was on a train with COVID. She knew. Why didn't she tell anybody? Don't I know it? Brian, thanks. Very interesting call. Here's Richard in the UAE. Go ahead, Richard. Hey, George. Nice Lovely to hear to from you. Go on. Happy, yeah, go on, sir. Happy New Year. Happy New yeah, Year to you. Really, go on. I, a really quick question, a really quick um, comment. Yeah. Is, is, is regards you saying that the suppressing freedom of speech regarding Donald Trump's suppression on Twitter. Yeah, that will quickly spread now, to other people. Now, yeah, yeah, well, well, it, it, it may do, it may do. Well, it but, already has, well, Richard, it already yeah, has. Yeah. They started yeah, with, yeah. Uh, what's his name, Alex Jones, the nutter uh, uh, Alex Jones. Uh, now it's Donald Trump, General Flynn. Uh, I don't know. I, Who's your I, favorite politician? I, I, I must admit, I did used to watch Alex Jones just for comedic. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, it was uh, sometimes not so funny, though. Um, my, 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 my point is on an obvious one, though, Richard. Who guards the guards? Who decides who can be heard? Nick Clegg? Well, well. There's, there's a very important point to be made here, George, is, is, is that my favourite politician used to be you. <laughs> it, it subsequently became Jeremy Corbyn. You might, you might, uh, you, you asked me the question, so yeah. I've answered. So, yeah, well, so but, now, but so the, my so, next so, question, so now, but my next question is then obvious, Richard. Uh, what happens when they come for Jeremy Corbyn's Twitter account? Well, the, the, the point, the point of, the, of the matter is, is that if you've got somebody who can do what a general ho-ho would do and spread malicious and inaccurate gossip... But who decides to, that, Richard? Who well, decides well, what's well, accurate just, and what's not well, accurate? If, if you just give me a minute, George, if you can see what... Um, Donald Trump said five days ago, which precipitated an assault on, on the Capitol in the US, and that's allowed to happen because some people are just an echo chamber of whatever he wants to say, then 
at some point, you've got to say, we're not going to give you any airwaves. But uh, because... this, ha this happened long before the events of Wednesday. They started badging and restricting Donald Trump's uh, Twitter feed during the election. In fact, exactly at the point of the Hunter Biden laptop, a story that was comprehensively suppressed. Well, that, I mean, that, that's an issue that I'm not, I'm not fully conversant with. But what I would say is this, I would say this very simply, is that you know, and you've already expressed it several times, that some things that Donald Trump is saying is not true. Well, that's uh, absolutely correct. But uh, let me go back to your new favorite, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. If Jeremy Corbyn started tweeting uh, about Israel and Palestine and anti-Semitism, how long do you think it would be before he was banned? Well, I, I actually don't know, George, but if he, if he said something that wasn't actually true... Yeah, but uh, the, I think, these, I these think things very are... very quickly. But these things think, are subject... See, is it true uh, that Israel is an apartheid state? Is it true or is it not true? That's not something you can uh, calculate on a, on, on a calculating machine. That's a matter of well, opinion. Well, exactly, but some of the so things... So if that... Jeremy said it, it's OK if he gets banned? No, 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 I, I don't agree with that at all. What I'm saying is, if somebody says something is patently not true... Well, well define then... patently. I know well, plenty of people that, that, who would say that, 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 it's that, that, patently that, that, not true that Israel is well, an apartheid if, if, state. If, 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 it, if it's a matter of opinion of whether of whether Israel is an apartheid state in Gaza, you can say it yeah. is a matter of opinion. And what if that the thought. owner, what if the owner of Facebook says that's not an acceptable opinion? Well, th that's something you'd have to take up with them. But, but, no, but, Richard, but, you, you're an intelligent but, man. You know where George. I've now put you in this debate. You know the corner yeah, but, yeah, you're but, now yeah, in. George. You yeah, are, yeah, you George. are, because you hate Donald Trump, you are happy to see him suppressed. But what about no, the people, no, no, what about the people no. you Ab love and Absolute, other people hate? Absolutely the opposite, George. What I'm saying is, when you can see something that is patently untrue... You keep saying and, patently. And, and, you keep saying that's okay, not a scientific... Okay, okay. George, that's George, not George, a scientific... Richard, George, that's George, not... The point. Well, George, I will in a minute. The point, I will in a minute. But patently is not a scientific term. One man's patently is another man's opposite of patently. OK. I, I can appreciate that. But what I will say is that if something's going to be an apartheid state, that is a definition that you must really... But millions of people don't. Millions of people in this country, uh, millions of people everywhere else, don't accept that nomenclature. Don't accept that definition. But if you allow them to close down who can say what, where... Come on, Richard, you're too smart not to know where we've no, got come in on, this come argument. On, come, on, come on, George, if, if somebody says very blatantly, which is, which is uh, in contradiction of all rules and regulations to say, let's go and march on this and we've got to be, we've got to be tough with these people, we've got to be fighting. I don't think he said that on Twitter, did he? No, what, what, no, what, he, he didn't say on Twitter, he actually said it on video that we've, we've got to be tough and fight. Uh, I, I'm not sure I heard those words, but he didn't say it on Twitter. We've agreed on that. No, not on, no, not on Twitter. But it's Twitter that it. banned him. Yes, it's Twitter that's banned him, but because he's actually incited people to go and do something that they went and, 
maybe they would have done oh, it anyway. Oh, don't be such a maiden aunt, Richard. You're living in the Middle East, which had an hey. Arab Spring not so long ago. Don't be such a maiden aunt. Thanks very much for your call. Let's hear from Professor William Hogan, who's the representative of the doctors for Assange. Julian Assange remains shivering in Belmarsh prison this evening on this bitter winter's night. Professor William Hogan, my apologies for keeping you waiting. Welcome to the mother of all talk shows. Um, like me, you were celebrating a great victory in the, uh, in the High Court, the refusal of the extradition request, but the uh, taste turned to ashes in our mouths when bail was denied. Where do we stand now, Professor? Well, you're absolutely right. Where we stand is that Julian Assange, a journalist, a publisher, remains in maximum security prison in the UK for nothing more than accepting documents from a source and publishing them on the internet. Exactly, uh, for which he's entitled, in my view, to the Nobel Prize. Instead, he still faces 170 years of penal servitude in the dungeons in Colorado. That's correct, and even the judge in um the, the magistrate, Vanessa Baritzer, agreed. Uh, she, she surmised, based on evidence presented at his extradition hearing, that he would be sent to ADX uh, Florence in, Car in Colorado, which uh, one prisoner was um, disciplined because he told his one grandson to tell his other grandson that he loved him. That's how terrible a system it is. Yes, vile uh, indeed. Um, but of course, the reason why bail had to be requested be, was because the U.S. government uh, insisted that it's going to appeal her judgment not to extradite him. What can you tell us about that? Well, I'm not an expert in the U.K. legal system, obviously, and I'm not a lawyer. But um, the fact is that the judge found that Julian is mentally ill. He's depressed. Uh, it's our position, as it is of the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, that Julian Assange is being tortured by the United States and the United Kingdom for nothing more than journalism. And um, the judge herself said he's at risk for suicide, his mental health is not good, um, and therefore he shouldn't be extradited to the United States, but it's okay to keep him in supermax at the UK. It's a contradictory decision, and uh, we, we deplore it and we call it out and condemn it. Especially as there were alternatives, like electronic tags, uh, like uh, house arrest, uh, and so on, uh, that would have uh, obviated the real danger uh, of Julian's mental health further deteriorating, or for that matter, his physical health being affected by the huge presence of coronavirus in the jail. That's right. As of a week or two ago, there was 59 cases. They were all being moved to his wing of the prison. Um, we said he should have been bailed back in March. We issued a statement in condemnation of the judge's uh, refusal to grant bail back in March. For those two reasons, he's being tortured and now he's at risk of COVID-19. Uh, those two reasons both still stand. He's still being tortured, and he's still at risk of COVID-19. He could have been monitored adequately. He's one of the most famous men in the world. It's, it's you know, unfathomable to uh, envision how he could abscond. He has new reasons, we found out, in the last nine months to stay put. He has a fiance and two children. Uh, it's hard to imagine him putting that at risk. Um, so it's just, uh, it's inconceivable that he would even attempt to abscond and uh, he could easily be monitored. And given the, his mental and physical illness issues, he should have been released on bail. And it's a terrible travesty of a decision to keep him in Belmarsh. What, uh, what kind of impact on his mental health must there have been to win your case and then end up right back where you started, behind the same bars. Horrible impact on mental health. Um, 
I was devastated to think about how he himself must have felt that day. Um, and he's been through this over and over again. The UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention rules that he's being arbitrarily detained and the UK must release him uh, and, 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 and compensate him for the arbitrary detention. And then the UK announces it's just going to flout international law in the UN. Your foreign office, um, FCDO, I forget exactly what that FCDO, stands for. Yeah. <laughs> tweeted out that they love the UN. Happy anniversary today of the 75th anniversary of the first General Assembly of the UN, but how hypocritical. Your, your government is ignoring the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. Your government is ignoring the Special Rapporteur on Torture. And, um, uh, you know, well, the, same, uh, the same uh, Foreign Office uh, tweeted how concerned they are about uh, freedom of the press in Uganda. Uh, but not as concerned, apparently, about the freedom of the press uh, in the case of WikiLeaks. Uh, finally, Professor, and I'm grateful to you, and I apologize I was late in getting to you. Um, what, uh, what are the possibilities, in your view, in the next week of uh, the outgoing President Trump pardoning uh, Julian Assange, dropping uh, the extradition request? Boy, it's really hard to say um, what Trump's going to do. I would have thought he would have pardoned Assange, uh, but then when he pardoned the Blackwater uh, criminals who uh, shot innocent civilians in Iraq, uh, that hope kind of went out of my mind. So I, I don't see a lot of hope for that. There's still a lot of people campaigning for that, including myself. I still write the White House uh, every few days. Uh, urging a pardon for Assange, and I write my senators and representative. I uh, hope he does. He should. Um, he should end the torture and medical neglect of Assange. He could do it today. Um, we'll see. Yeah, he may have pardoned these BlackRock people precisely so that he could then pardon Assange. That's a good point. I've heard that point. I hope it's true. I hope he does. Professor William Hogan, uh, thank you for joining us. We must all uh, hope and pray that the persecution of Julian Assange comes to an end soon. Thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us. Uh, now, uh, the poll is closed. The results are in. 23% of you agree uh, that uh, Donald Trump should have been cancelled on social media. 77% disagree, 4,693 votes. I think that may be uh, the biggest poll that we have ever had. Yes, my director tells me in my ear, it is indeed the biggest. Lucy is in London on Julian Assange. Go ahead, Lucy. Hi, George, how are you? I'm good, thank you very much. Well, I hope you do well up in Rutherglen. Thank you. Thank you very much. You sound like you might be from round about there. I certainly am. I'm from Proven Mill originally. How I'm also a member of your political party. Oh, wonderful. And it's getting better. I, I, <laughs> and I trained in the NHS in Glasgow. I'm originally from Proven Mill. Wow. Brilliant. Brilliant. But there you you're go. interested in Julian's but, case. I'm very interested. We have got a, a lovely friend here who lives in South London. His name is David Simpson. He has been outside Belmarsh since Julian Assange was sent there. And the little numbers grew from two, three, four, six to what it is now. And we were all elated. I even put a comment on your Facebook page there to say, George, Julian might be getting bail. I got so excited and all the people were all, I, I was actually on duty that day. However, this sadness that the man has again been put in there is absolutely criminal. And I don't believe for one minute that Pretty Patel will have any empathy for him whatsoever, or, or media. And it's really something now that has to be 
really fought for to save this man and get him out of there. Yes, uh, I mean, the US said they're going to appeal, but they haven't yet appealed. They've still got about mm. nine days to <laughs> appeal. One assumes yes. that they will, unless Trump decides not to, uh, and that is still a possibility. Uh, but if they uh, do uh, put their appeal in, then we have to struggle might and main to have Julian released uh, pending that appeal because uh, that will take a very, very long time. And this man is an unconvicted prisoner in a maximum security prison. Absolutely, absolutely. And, 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 and that's the whole, the whole thing. And just what um, Dr. Hogan was saying there a few minutes ago, and yourself, you, he could have quite easily get sent home on bail sure. on the electronic tag. Sure. Uh, uh, and uh, I can't help thinking, hoping, praying uh, that the uh, upper courts uh, will listen to that plea uh, when Julian's appeal against the refusal of bail uh, is forthcoming. Lucy, thanks. A wonderful call. Great to hear that accent from Proven Mill. Let's hear a different accent in the news with Jamie Lowe. The mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Sputnik News. Every adult in the UK will be offered a coronavirus vaccine by the autumn, Health Secretary Matt Hancock has promised. Hancock also did not rule out the strengthening of current restrictions, saying the NHS was under very serious pressure. It comes after almost 60,000 new cases of coronavirus were reported in the UK on Saturday, and the number of deaths after a positive test passed 80,000. A further 508 people who tested positive for coronavirus have died in hospital in England, bringing the total number of confirmed deaths reported in hospitals to 55,580, NHS England has said. Scotland has recorded three deaths of coronavirus patients and 1,877 new cases in the past 24 hours, according to official figures. And Public Health Wales have reported another 45 deaths and 1,660 new cases. In Northern Ireland, 17 more deaths have been reported in the past 24 hours, along with 1,112 new cases. The Health Secretary said he did not want to speculate on whether the government would further strengthen restrictions after warnings from scientists on Saturday that they may need to be stricter. Elsewhere, Germany's death toll from COVID-19 has reached 40,000 and Russia has recorded 22,851 new COVID-19 cases and 456 deaths in the past 24 hours. Britain's Home Secretary Priti Patel has said police officers will not hesitate to enforce lockdown rules as she defended the way police have handled breaches. She said rising numbers of coronavirus cases and deaths illustrated the need for strong enforcement. It comes after the National Police Chiefs Council published guidance saying officers should issue fines more quickly when rules are broken. More than 30,000 fines have been handed out by forces in England and Wales. A British nurse who lived in a caravan for nine months to protect her mother from coronavirus says moving back into her house was like winning the lottery. Sarah Link and her husband Gary, who usually share a home with her mother, brought the caravan in March in England's black country to allow them to isolate. They moved back home for Christmas after her mother received the vaccine. The caravan bought for £600 and parked on their own drive in Cradley outside Birmingham allowed Link to continue working at Birmingham's Queen Elizabeth Hospital and her husband at his fishmonger's business. She said that she'd do it again tomorrow. She would have done anything to protect her mum. 
black boxes of a passenger plane which crashed into the sea soon after takeoff from Jakarta, Indonesia on Saturday have been located, officials say. A small flotilla of ships has been searching the site and Navy divers are expected to be able to retrieve the two flight recorders from the relatively shallow waters. Aircraft parts and human remains have also been found. The Srivijaya Air Boeing 737 was carrying 62 people when it vanished from radar on its journey to Borneo. A prominent follow of the baseless conspiracy theory QAnon has been charged over the US Capitol riots. Jacob Anthony Chansley, known as Jake Angeli, is in custody on charges including violent entry and disorderly conduct. Chansley, who calls himself the QAnon shaman, is allegedly the man pictured with a painted face, fur hat and horns inside Congress on Wednesday. President Donald Trump faces another impeachment charge for his role in the unrest. Proceedings are expected to begin tomorrow. The US Vice President Mike Pence will attend Democratic President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration, unlike President Trump. If Trump does not attend the ceremony on January 20th, he will be the first president in 150 years not to do so. Biden has said that he would welcome Pence at the swearing-in, but not Trump. When President Donald Trump signed the 2.3 trillion coronavirus relief and government funding bill into law in December, so began the 180-day countdown for US intelligence agencies to tell Congress what they know about UFOs. The Director of National Intelligence and the Secretary of Defense have a little less than six months now to provide the Congressional Intelligence and Armed Services Committees with an unclassified report about unidentified aerial phenomena. It's a stipulation that was tucked into the committee comment section of the Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal year 2021, which was contained in the massive spending bill. That report must contain detailed analyses of UFO data and intelligence collected by the Office of Naval Intelligence, the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force and the FBI, according to the Senate Intelligence Committee's directive. The report should also identify any potential national security threats posed by UFOs and assess whether any of the nation's adversaries could be behind such activity. Electricity is gradually being restored in Pakistan following a huge power cut across the country which led to every city reporting outages. Homes nationwide were suddenly plunged into darkness from about midnight. Power is now back in most cities, but officials warn that it could still be a few hours before electricity is fully restored. The outage is believed to have been caused by a fault at a power station in the south of the country. And finally, and I can't quite believe that I'm about to say this, but Denmark's flagship broadcaster has suffered criticism over its newest children's TV programme called John Dillamond, an animation starring a man with a penis so massive and flexible it can save children from danger, fetch objects from a river and operate as, you won't believe this one, a pogo stick. The show, whose 13 episodes are available to watch on the DR Network's website, follows the character as he navigates an array of unexpected scenarios caused by his inexplicably huge genitalia. In one episode, Dilliman uses his gigantic stripy organ as a lead for his dog, but quickly finds himself inundated with requests from his neighbours to take their pets out for a walk too. And in another episode, he breaks a friend's vase with his penis. The show's opening montage also shows him using his genitalia to keep away a lion from a group of children. A spokesperson for Dios said that most of those who criticised the programme did so without having seen it. She said, in Denmark, it is now a huge success and children are watching it in big numbers. And the jokes just write themselves, don't they? So I'm going to remain professional and leave them to you to come up with. That's the latest here on Sputnik News. I'm Jamie Lowe. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway, only on Sputnik Radio. Now, we haven't had too much time for calls this evening. A really cracking show, lots of great guests, and another great one coming up. But here's the number because after the guest, it's all yours, okay, right up to 10 o'clock. 02077. 
982255 if you're in the UK. If you're in the US, 001-757-744-4480. Now, Dr. David Liddle, OBE, is the Chief Executive Officer of the Scottish Drug Forum, and he's kindly agreed to be interviewed tonight about the drug crisis in my own country of Scotland, where in the last 13 years, the number of drug deaths has risen uh, by close to 200% uh, percent and makes us the drugs death capital of Europe, which if you knew Scotland when I left it, and that's not long ago, I'm now back, but I left it uh, in 1983 uh, to move to London, you'd never have believed that statistic would ever come to pass. But it is uh, indisputable, and David Liddle uh, joins me now. David, thanks very much for uh, joining us. First of all, to what do you ascribe uh, the really disastrous drug situation in Scotland? Good, good evening. Well, I think the first thing to say is that our drug problem in Scotland, uh, as you'll, you'll know, but uh, I guess most of the listeners won't, developed in the early 1980s as a result, particularly of uh, policies of the Conservative government at the time through Margaret Thatcher and the whole deindustrialization. So it was very much uh, the, the crea creation of the heroin problem was very much linked to poverty and deprivation. So since that time of the early 1980s, we've had an increasing scale of drug problem, which remains very much linked to issues of poverty and deprivation. So now we have um, in the region of 60,000 people with, with drug problems in Scotland, and th that figure has remained the same, or well, pretty much the same for the last 15 years or so. So uh, the scale of our problem per head of population is probably the biggest in Europe. And so part of the, the reasons, if you like, for the high number of drug-related deaths is linked to, to the high number of people with drug problems. But having said that, there's also a big issue in Scotland with our, our treatment system. So, for example, at the moment, of that 60,000, we potentially have about 40% in treatment, which is, is lower than England and lower than other countries in Europe, which have a a more successful approach to, to treating people with drug problems. But not only is the figure only 40%, we have significant numbers of people who are dropping out of services on a regular basis. So retention is a massive issue in terms of a, a, actually uh, um, not being able to keep people in treatment. And I guess the, the most important aspect of being in treatment is that that is, is evident strongly, particularly being on opioid substitution therapy, that's methadone or buprenorphine, has a protective factor against fatal overdose. So what we need to be doing in particular is actually increasing the numbers of people in treatment over the long term um, in Scotland and, and retaining them much more effectively than we're, we're doing at the moment. Well, let me test your first proposition. Um, poverty and deprivation exists in all parts of the United Kingdom, in England, in Wales, uh, there are places with much worse poverty and deprivation than in Scotland. But our uh, drug problem is, in one case, uh, twice as bad, in the other case, three times as bad. How do you account for that? Well, well it's, it's, it, I guess it's it, on one level it's not easy, but certainly uh, there is a similar situation in England that uh, drug problems are concentrated in the areas of poverty and deprivation and also obviously um, the whole issues of inequality, um, benefits, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, plays its, its part in relation to that. I mean, I, I don't think there's an easy, easy explanation to, to, to that, but certainly across the UK, what you saw in comparison to other European countries in the, in the 80s was a lack of intervention around the mass unemployment at that point, which uh, um, other European countries had significant interventions to, to actually stem uh, the increase in unemployment and actually, you know, created jobs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the the issue is one of of hope and uh, aspiration in a 
in a reasonable future life, which is, is at the core of this. Now, beyond that, um, obviously, we have now second and third generation problems. So it, it's no longer, if you like, just poverty and deprivation, but it's now very much linked to, to issues around childhood trauma um, and indeed adult trauma. So we've got mental health issues then very much entrenched with, with a drug problem, which makes it very difficult to deal with. Alongside that, we have now, um, for example, 77% of those people that, that died um, in 2019 were over the age of 35. So we've got a, a significant problem, or if you like, a, an older group of people. Obviously, yeah. 35 is not I mean, particularly old, but... Um, no, but, it, uh, yeah, it's old for a drug death, uh, but the... You see, I'm, I'm still struggling <clears> with this. Uh, areas of South Wales that I know very well, areas of the former coalfield in England that I know very well, as, a, as a, an honorary member of the, the Miners' Union, I know both these areas very well. Uh, poverty and deprivation is worse in both of those places than it has ever been in Scotland. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm searching for whether there's a, a specifically Scottish angle uh, on this. Uh, it also goes without saying that there are parts of Eastern Europe uh, and Southern Europe uh, that have more poverty and deprivation than we do, but far fewer drug deaths. Well, I mean, I think, you know, I, I suppose I would come back to the fact that, you know, the, the evidence is clear in terms of that that link. You, you know, it, it, so, it, but exactly the, the, the reasons why Scotland, um, you know, has a higher rate than other countries with similar or higher levels of deprivation it, it, it is a, a question that, uh, you know, people have tried to, to answer, but I, I honestly don't have an answer to that. No, okay. Uh, but know, I'm it, just it, wondering, it, well, let, it, me, it, let, yeah, me, let me yeah. posit a, a hypothesis yeah. uh, that our gigantic spike in drug deaths has coincided exactly uh, with the period of SNP government in Scotland. The SNP government cut the number of beds available to people and has presided over the figure you gave earlier of only 40% of addicts in treatment and an increasing number of them dropping out. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, my, I suppose my view would be that uh, successive uh, governments have not been uh, successful and not paid enough attention to, to the issue of people with drug problems. Uh, and and a large, to a large extent, that, I guess, is to do with the population that we're talking about who are, um, as I've said, mostly come from our most deprived communities and, and are marginalised and, and far more marginalised than the general population of, of those poorest communities. So I, I think that's been successive governments that have, that have um, if you like, you know, not invested significant amounts within, within treatment and care, but also... Um, I suppose not faced up to, to some of the challenges that there are specifically within, um, for example, the, the, the National Health Service Addiction Services, where you know you have, uh, I suppose, historically been services that have operated maybe in a similar way to services for the general public. Um, those would be with appointment systems, quite rigid programs, and if you if you miss appointments, then you, you're potentially left to to drop out of the service. So all of those issues have been around for a long time uh, and we've struggled to, to deal with them, um, obviously in recent times under the SNP, but previously under the, the, the Labour Liberal Democrat administrations too. So this is, uh, you know, not a new um, problem and, and it's a thorny one, obviously, in terms of yeah, how to, of course, to, to deal uh, with it. I'd, I'd be the, um, I'd be the but, last man to yeah. leap to the defence of the Labour Liberal Democrat administration, but there's absolutely no doubt that these multiplications in drug deaths have occurred over the last uh, period in which the SNP have been in power. And the Absolutely. First Minister herself has conceded that, uh, has said that it's completely unacceptable. Uh, the minister uh, uh, responsible uh, was sacked. Uh, so there's no disputing uh, the government in Scotland's failure on this. But moving on, David, uh, what's the answer to uh, the problem of drugs? I hear a lot of people uh, talking, for example, about the Portugal example. Uh, is Portugal worth exploring more seriously than we have done? 
Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And, and I think, you know, what, what is interesting, I mean, Portugal tends to be characterised as, as an approach involving decriminalisation only. Um, it hasn't been that. De decriminalisation has been part of a whole package of measures that they've put in place. And I think I would describe that, I suppose, as an approach that involves, um, if you like, social inclusion as opposed to, to social exclusion, which has been, I suppose, a, a, a common a, a approach up, up to now. So Portugal have also looked at um, better treatment as part of that social inclusion programs, including employment programs, better uh, welfare benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a whole range of things that they've put in place, which, which seems to be working. Now, interestingly, in the Scottish context, we've argued that, that under the existing legislation, we can uh, deliver decriminalisation through what, what is a, a currently a system of recorded warnings that are given to people with small amounts of cannabis so we already have a degree of uh, decriminalisation and our argument is that that should be extended. But we would like to see decriminalisation alongside all of these other measures, measures which look at things like, uh, you know, supported employment programmes, et cetera, et cetera. Because what we have is a, a, a population of people with drug problems who are, um, you know, significant amounts of unemployment, probably 90% of, of that population are, are unemployed and on benefits. So we should be doing far more across a whole range of measures to help people reintegrate or in fact integrate for the first time because what we have in that population of 60,000 is, is a group who on average I suppose would tend to have left school very early with little um, effective education and then probably 50% or so of that 60,000 have also been in the care system. So um, we know if you like overall the causes of the problem uh, and we could be doing far more to assist people to, towards recovery. But the first step of that is in particular, and, and as you said, the government is now paying greater attention to this, is actually looking at the whole issue of, of treatment. So one of the first things in the these draft medication-assisted treatment standards is actually to deliver prescribing on the same day. Now, this has been common practice in Europe for many, many years, but we've taken probably three or four weeks to get people onto methadone or, or buprenorphine. So we are very supportive of that measure to, to, to shift things so that actually people get treatment on the day that they're motivated to receive it. So that's a hugely important uh, change alongside giving choice. And as I've said already, in terms of making sure that if people do drop out, and uh, certainly the Dundee Drug Commission highlighted this significantly, that in a population of potentially only 1,300, 452 people um, of that 1,300 actually dropped out in a year. So you can see that the, the churn, if you like, of people going into treatment and dropping out is significant. So many people are not in treatment long enough for it to make a positive impact on their lives. So methadone and buprenorphine as the, the sort of first stage to, to, to keep people alive and then engage with them more effectively around a whole range of measures that can improve their lives. And I think also then longer term, obviously that, that should be happening just now, is also given that we know the backgrounds of people with drug problems and the sort of histories they have, we also know that if we intervene more effectively with vulnerable families, then we can stop the, the or, or uh, significantly reduce drug problems in, in the following generations. And, and that's something we've, we've failed to do so far. And we're seeing um, vulnerable young people starting now on, on, the, on the road to, to a, a drug problem, sadly. Um, but we need, do need much more to intervene with those uh, vulnerable families David, when children are, are born. David, uh, a very sombre and sad story. I'm grateful to you for putting it in some perspective. David Little, OBE, who is the Chief Executive of the Scottish Drug Forum. Thanks for joining us. Paul is on the line in London on the drug question. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, hi, Mr. Gallagher. I just, uh, just want to say a big fan of the show, man. It's an honour to finally speak to you. I've, I've thought Thank I'll you. be ringing for a bit. Um, yeah, I think, Mr. Gallagher, just with the, with the drug problem, um, I, I think our whole approach towards drugs um, in general, like, um, you, you, I, I call for complete uh, legislation of all uh, drugs, uh, Mr. Gallagher. Um, I'd look to put the by the time people actually seek help, they're after covering themselves 
um, with the tax they'd pay. And I suppose just put money into education. And, and you'd have to separate each substance from one another um, for starters. But like, there's no 17, 18 year old says, right, I want to be asleep in a porch in another three years. So it's very much a society problem, especially with heroin. But I suppose people are smoking weed, they're buying that from a drug dealer, they're gaining a bit of trust. I think um, um, decriminalising just even casts a cloud over it further. It's either go with complete legislation and education, um, and I suppose that's the only way you're going to tackle the problem, because it's very much a society um, problem now. Um, like your, your casual walking man on the street, is, is he's taking cocaine in the pub on a Friday night. Well, people tell me so. Uh, I, I'm, I have never seen it myself, but people tell me that that is the case. Um, I'm, I'm only interested in one thing, Paul, because I think that drugs are uh, very bad. Uh, I'm interested in would this policy lead to more people taking drugs uh, than now? What's your answer to that point? When you say drugs, Mr. Galloway, like you can't compare heroin to psychedelics, to mushrooms, for example, to cannabis, you know what I mean? To, uh, to cocaine, even to crack, to crystal meth. You'd have to, I suppose, if Pete, that's what I think people have this attachment, oh, it's drugs. And straight away you're creating ignorance there because you're not prepared. And like uh, your last guest said, with isolation, I think we've got communities that don't want to know how to deal with it, but like some people have a glass of wine in the evening, some people are asleep on a power bench with a bottle of wine. Some people can casually get on with their life, have a drug at the weekend. Um, I suppose, I think it's our ignorance is causing the heroin problem because it's not a social thing. It's, it's complete knockout. You just know, I suppose when they say a drug to be illegal, would have to have no positive effect, but I suppose before cocaine came in, if you were after a 10 points, you might be going top shelf Jager bombs, or you might even remember get home, whereas if you were a couple of lines, you might sober up. But personally, I, I'm not trying to glorify any uh, drug. I've had my own battles in the past, but I wouldn't shun anyone, um, and I think that is ignorance is causing the heroin problem. Um, especially. Um, I probably have my own ways of how you integrate it into society, but it's very much going on, um, and I don't see why you would not use it as a thing that if it was legal, if it was taxed, um, people are happy to go pay up 200 quid in the evening or on a Friday evening for a bag of coke, so why not, why, why not take that into government hands? Would it, would, would it be suppression of the South Americans that well. sooner be... I'd sooner be dealing uh, drugs with uh, co cocaine with the Bolivians than armed with the Saudis, Mr. Gallagher. Well, that was an interesting, if depressing, call, uh, Paul. I'm grateful to you for making it. Let me take a 60-second break to recover from it. You can count them. Yo, Mikey, what's happening? Joey! The usual? Sure. You looking fresh, man. You get a new haircut? Nah, brother. I just got that, you know, scholarship from the College of Knowledge. Oh, you got into the University of the Airwaves? Sure did, brother. I got knowledge coming out of my ears. GG, man. He knows what's up. I knew there was something new about you. Yo, reckon he take me? Everyone is welcome, brother. Even from Jersey. <laughs> Breaking news, expert analysis, and exclusive stories, all in one place. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Global higher education. With one of the world's best-known iconoclasts. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway. Now, uh, Andrew's story says, I agree, but Voltaire never uttered those words. It was Evelyn Hall. And uh, the end justifies the memes, says Trump has posing himself, has proven himself to be the master of distraction. And he desperately needs a distraction right now. If he heads to New York in the next 10 days and you happen to be in town, I'd avoid Fifth Avenue if you get my drift. I don't. Uh, uh, tell us more. 
Uh, I, Paul Jones says, um, I remember instances of people with views I totally objected to being given a platform. They were then expertly debated and subsequently found wanting. I'm referring to the leader of the BNP on Question Time and AC Grayling on Twitter. All Twitter has done is alienated debate and stifled free speech. And David Young says, whilst I'm not a fan of Trump or Biden for that matter, I don't think he should have been cancelled on social media. Uh, no, I've done that one. Uh, I beg your pardon. Um, Peter Jeffries says whether folks agreed with him or not, they should be the ones to decide, not the platform. By banning him, it will cause far more division and harm. Let's hear from South Carolina, where Mike disagrees with me. That's why he's welcome. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. Hey, George. Great, great to talk to you again. And you. Your show, and, and I seldom disagree with you, but this is one of the times that I do okay, disagree. Okay, go ahead, yeah. Uh, I think you're confusing uh, freedom of speech with uh, uh, actual uh, freedom of corporations and, and free enterprise. And, and that's a big problem, George. I mean, here's the thing. Um, Donald Trump already has a platform and has had for over the four years that he's been in office and before that, uh, where you can go to, you know, uh, uh, you know, DonaldTrump.com, okay, which he controls and he can do whatever he wants to. And if his followers want to follow him over there and listen to what he has to say, they're more than welcome to do that. But the real problem is you're confusing freedom of speech, which I, I know that there's some subtle differences between freedom of speech in the UK and freedom of speech in the United States. But in the United we States, have le we, we have less of it than you do. That, that is exactly right. And, and in the United States here, the First Amendment to the Constitution doesn't say that, uh, uh, that, that government will intervene with corporations. It says nothing about that. It says that the government will not impede your free speech. Now, it, here's, the, here's the big deal. We have given everything, everything in this world over to corporations. And, and it's not just uh, uh, Facebook and Twitter and, and YouTube and the rest of them. I myself have been, have been banned from YouTube, okay, uh, for things that, you know, they said I said that, uh, you know, uh, they wouldn't even tell me what I said. But, but, but the thing is, those are private corporations. They have every right to, you know, you, you are not paying to speak on Twitter, okay? No, you that's true, the but, but it's my uh, air that they're using. It's my sphere. It's my uh, internet sphere. It's my ether that they're using. Oh, I, it's yours I, and I mine and belongs to all of us. And they have been allowed, you're right. If your point, Mike, is that we should never have allowed these monopoly interests to grow and grow and grow, of course, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, but uh, well, even, that's where we are. But George, even here in the United States, uh, the Congress is, is, is trying to step in to tell these companies that they must, uh, uh, you know, monitor what's being said and, and passed around on their sites. Now, that is government actually interfering with, you know, the corporations. That's, but, yeah, but uh, that, isn't that unconstitutional? Uh, well, you'd think that it would be, wouldn't you? When, 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 That's when the, the government seeking Facebook, to impede uh, freedom of speech. They're telling, they're telling Facebook and Twitter and all these others that they have to monitor and make sure that these people aren't uh, uh, lying and telling, you know, just all these great falsehoods. So they're, put, they're putting those people in, in an area where, where they have to be the police of everything that is said on, on, their, on their platforms. And, and that's just, you know, there's no way that, no way that they can do that. Well, and, they, they and, could. Uh, I mean, uh, if, uh, if a newspaper uh, published an article about me and then readers uh, went on the comments column and defamed me, uh, or uh, or uh, th threaten me with violence or whatever. Uh, the newspaper is responsible, but Twitter is not responsible because it claims, oh. and the law the law endorses this at the moment. It claims it's not a publisher. It claims it's okay, merely but... merely a tech platform. If it's a merely That's a right, tech right? platform, it's got no right to uh, to police what goes on uh, in its uh, on its platform, does it? 
but the, but there's a difference between uh, if a newspaper libels you than if another person does and the newspaper repeats it. Now, now that's a totally different ball of, of wax there. And and when you're looking at this, you know, even even the major news networks, okay, what we call the mainstream media or the lamestream media, which which in here in the United States includes you know ABC, NBC, CBS, MSNBC, Fox, and all the rest of them, there have already been court cases. Uh, with, with Fox particularly, where the Supreme Court has ruled that Fox doesn't even have to tell the truth in their news. I mean, I mean that's how bad well, it is. Well, there would be no news if you had to tell the truth. Mike, uh, thanks. That's exactly it's what I'm a, saying. It's been a pleasure to disagree with you for once. Let's hear from Colby in Fife in Scotland. Go ahead, Colby. Uh, good evening, George. Evening, sir. Uh, good evening, and thank you so much for uh, taking my call. Uh, yeah. And can I firstly say what a magnificent hat, sir? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, there was many points I was wanting to raise uh, with yourself. Unfortunately, Brian, earlier on, uh, I was slapping my head with the points he was making uh, from Fife as well. But, but um, I, I, I certainly hope that we can have you back uh, and, and the Scottish Parliament of Holyrood, sir. Um, thank you. I, we need a strong voice. Someone strong, I, I, I disagreed with you in the past. And it's a case there that having, having looked more into your, your history yourself, um, I, I can only apologise for the, the former views that I held that were actually um, that, that were not based, based on fact. It was based on... Well, you know, that's very uh, kind of you and very noble of you to say so. I must say, if I had a pound for everyone that said that to me, I'd be a very rich man, Corby. Uh, anyway, but, well, where do you stand on... Oh, is it the drugs matter or the COVID? No, no. Well, a whole lot, a whole lot, sir. Uh, the, the drugs matter. I've had my issues in the past. I understand um, that, um, that there can be benefits with regards to using, um, say, for example, uh, DMT uh, investigations um, with regards to uh, understand their own minds. Uh, a molecule created by our bodies and plants. That, that's a different matter. What, what was that actually? What, what you speak to yourself about was Hamza Yusuf in the Scottish Parliament. And the he's bill the, uh, he's passed, the justice secretary. Yes, exactly. And, and and the hate bill speech that he is trying to force through through our parliament, with regards to when when you're talking about Twitter, I've actually stopped all all social media myself. Uh, this is the case, but with regards to someone who is supposed to represent our nation, which uh, has a grand history of, of expression, and it's the case that with with this bill that he's trying to put through, pretty much as you were discussing earlier on with the SNP. Yeah. Is it the case, you know, what, what is your thoughts on that, sir? Well, it's a good point that you make. Uh, the hate speech bill that is proposed in the Scottish Parliament by the Justice Secretary, Hamza Youssef, uh, is opposed by uh, the Faculty of Advocates, the Law Society, the churches, uh, the journalists. It's opposed by everyone who fears the chilling impact of moves against freedom of speech, That's either so in a done. bill or, in, as we've just been debating, uh, on closing people down on social media. It, first of all, uh, chills and encourages self-censorship, so you don't actually say what you mean or you believe because you're afraid to, because there might be consequences if you do, uh, even legal consequences in Scotland if this bill uh, were to go through. This bill uh, um, criminalizes conversations in a family, around the family dinner table, in private. The minister has made clear that under his proposals, you could be prosecuted for something that you said to your auntie at the Christmas dinner table, uh, even though no one outside your uh, front room even heard it or ever knew that such a conversation took place. This is a kind of madness and is likely, Colby, to engender more hate, more division than already exists in Scotland, which is not a small amount of hate, as you know. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And that's why we need a voice like yours in our parliament, sir. Mr. Galloway, I God appreciate you taking my call. God bless and you. And thank you very much for your time. Thank and you. And I hope to see you standing in our, our hall at Holyrood. 
and actually contesting this move, Ed, contesting this matter. Thank you very much, sir. God bless you. Thanks, Colby. Uh, Jill is in London. She was at the Assange hearing, uh, but was arrested for a COVID breach and fined. I've actually got a video clip of her being arrested. Let's see that first before we talk to Jill. My goodness, Jill. Yes. How are you? How did you survive that ordeal? Well, I tell you, it's pretty harrowing. You never think in your lifetime you're going to live in this kind of a police state where you can be doing what you've been told, wait at the side of the court door. Six people went in in front of me for the public seating in the gallery, it's our right as citizens to observe the legal proceedings. And this is for us to monitor. This is exercising our rights to make sure that things are going as they should be. And so I waited as the next person in line with several other people. And on two instances, the police came along and harassed us waiting in line. They took over that courthouse, totally illegal. The police are not supposed to be going in to the courthouse and tell, telling staff what to do there. They went in and told the man who was running the door to push us away from the door. And um, the first man had told us, just wait by the side. The second man comes out after they've briefed him and says, well, you can stay, you know. But the woman at the side and several policemen as well, all police staff, were telling us we had to go. There were no more seats. And we said that's not what he said. He said we could wait here. But they were just blatantly lying and making it up. And they don't even care anymore. They're just telling you, you have to go. They don't want Assange around. They don't want him spreading any information. They don't want us telling people about it. They don't want the media showing us talking about it. Anything they can do to get rid of us, they're doing. And what happened to you after that? Where did they take you? Well, after uh, they, they told me to go back and stand where I was standing, he said, when somebody leaves the court, you can come in and I'll come and shout out and you can come in then. So I was waiting back there. We saw my friend Eric, the 92-year-old man, was being harassed. He was, and man he was also arrested, aged 92. Yes. Yes, he was taken. They, they thought better of it and didn't actually go through with the arrest, even though they read him his rights and everything. But as soon as they saw a hundred cameras on them and everybody yelling, shame on you, and all of us uh, shaming them, they basically had to change tack halfway through and stop with the arrest and uh, change tack. And they say they were just removing him from a dangerous scene and drove him home and uh, tried to do the you know, officer-friendly routine uh, at the end of it because they knew they were in so much trouble and it was already so well shared on social media. Around the world, yeah. Minute. And you were Absolutely. fined. How, mu how much were you fined? 400 pounds. What? Well, I certainly won't pay it. I will be going into court because I, I just w will not stand for this. I'm not going to stand by and watch our freedoms being stripped away. Those police take an oath when they become a police officer to uphold the human rights of all the citizens. But instead, they're destroying it. The corruption is just unbelievable amongst themselves. You just don't want to believe that they are that bad, but they are. They just will lie about anything and make Jill, it up uh, as they go along. Jill, because of the hour, we need to press on, but keep us, keep us posted uh, on your story. We would like to follow it, and I'm sure the audience would uh, too. Let's go to Minnesota and talk with Justin. Go ahead, Justin. How are you, George? I'm good by the grace of God. Thank you. Um, sir, I want to say to you that uh, I've been a watcher of the show now for about uh, 
a good year. I got to say, you're a funny guy. The way you express your opinions, um, the way you put out good information, but and um, thanks. I want to thank you for that. Thank um, you. But what I have to say, and I uh, voted for Donald Trump here in the United States. I don't the level. You you British people taught me a well. Excuse me, you're Scottish, I think, but. I'm also British. All that, right, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. You taught me something very useful, and that is the word acquiescence. The us Americans are acquiescing to powerful corporations right now, and I think this is very dangerous. What is going on here, here in the United States, and. I don't know what to do next. I'm honestly nervous for what's going to happen next, man. And I mean, I believe in God, but like, I just, I hope for the best, George. What do you fear most? What do I fear most, George? I fear this. There's a, a movement. Clearly, the Trump movement was denied, and I feel. That I fear martial law here in the states. Um, I I don't know, man. Like it's just so confusing what's going on right now, and I don't I don't know what to to do next. I I don't know what is the right move for us to any of us to do. Well, that is uh, quite a harrowing uh, call, Justin. Uh, please keep us uh, in touch with events in Minnesota. If I were you, I'd be joining the Movement for a People's Party. I'd be getting behind your former governor, uh, Jesse Ventura. Uh, it's very important that you don't lose hope because when hope is lost, oh, is lost. Hope and determination and faith. These are my uh, foundation stones and I commend them to you. Justin, thanks for the call. Barry is in Glasgow on the drugs issue. Go ahead, Barry. Uh, thanks for taking my call, George. Welcome. Uh, um, I'm just in terms of uh, phoning up with regard to what David was saying. Yeah, how did you, what did you think of that conversation? It is. It's a, it's, a, it's an uncomfortable truth that we're facing in, in Scotland, um, that communities have been decimated for decades, and I would say they've been un, done on two. But uh, and, and I'm no, I'm no, I'm saying this as non-political. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a subsequent go, uh, government since uh, devolution. I've again failed to, to tackle this ongoing, ongoing issue. But I suppose that recently, in terms of progress, the Scottish government actually put their hands up saying that yes, it's indefensible because we've got about nine, just about under 9,000 deaths. There's, a, there's a, a, a lot of dead people paved the way to uh, that, yeah, uh, yeah, to that yeah, admission. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and again, I'm, I'm aware of, I've actually buried a few of them, George. So a few of them are actually my friends. So again, and the most deprived communities it's up there with heart disease and strokes. You've got one death for every thousand working age adult within these communities. And again, there has to be, a, I would say going forward, has to be an emphasis on a rights-based approach to people who are actually the person-centred, the person's rights are at the centre of it. And then increasing treatment options as well, but not just in terms of addiction treatment, but also across the public sector, the voluntary sector. So again, I'd say an increase in improvement of systems thinking across all, level, all, all levels of government to actually accept that this is a society problem. Irrespective of a political party. Well, uh, but you say, that, you say that, Barry, but there are plenty of places in Britain that, yeah. that are more deprived than Scotland. In fact, right. much of Scotland isn't deprived yeah. at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There are countries but, but. in Europe that are more deprived than Scotland, but have far, far fewer deaths. Wales has one third of the deaths 
that Scotland does. Um, and I'm just searching for the reason for that. We've, we've, we've conducted a, a, an open event with Neil Finlay prior to Christmas, of, and I've, I've worked, worked for the past 10 years of policy and service delivery within Scotland. So it's again, it's about accountability, it's about governance, yeah. funding for, in terms of the funding. There was actually a funding cut of 55% exactly. since 2007, exactly. 2007 to 2019. Exactly. And, back to the, back again, and who was in power? Went, who was in power over those years? Uh, the, the cuts were actually from the Westminster Coalition government from 2010. No, who, who, who cut drug spending in Scotland? It's entirely devolved. It's nothing to do I, with I, Westminster. I, 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 I appreciate that, George, but I'm not, I'm not, here, I'm not here to criticise No, I, well, no, no, I, know you, I'm, I'm, I, I know you're not, I'm but I am. Because, I, I you know, see, I know that, because but, for but, me, you cannot separate the cuts implemented by the governments in Scotland. It's a wholly devolved area, nothing to do yeah. with the Tories in Westminster. Yeah. It's entirely devolved. You cannot mm -hmm. separate the failure mm -hmm. of the politicians uh, from this what, outcome. What, what I will say is that we've, we've done a recommendation for 11 recommendations have been sent to the First Minister and the New Drugs Policy Minister looking at accountability, commissioning the services, how services are commissioned in Scotland are different from England, England also in terms of how the, 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 in terms of accountability, governance, financial governance, uh, how how service again services are used and uh, how services are actually unit costs uh, as well as unit cost assessment of local need um, again and have an inclusive and collaborative approach to how we ac actually tackle again an uncomfortable go back to what I said an uncomfortable truth uncomfortable that, truth uh, right and uh, yeah, it's uh, very very uh, uncomfortable I'm grateful for I your know. call. Thanks for it. Thank uh, Brid is in Ireland on the Biden laptop. Go ahead, Brid. <laughs> yeah, hi, George. Thanks for having me on. And I just want to say, first of all, that um, I want to commend you for highlighting the whole Julian Assange issue. If I can just make one point about sure. that. Sure. Um, I just think there's something about uh, what he did which uh, can't, can't be pardoned, which is that he's betrayed those secrets, those monetary secrets. And I know that what you but have he, highlighted on... No, yeah. Brid, Brid, let me stop you and I'll let you back in. Uh, yeah. He didn't have any military secrets. He was not in the uh, United States military. He's not a United States citizen. He wasn't in the United States. He owes no duty to the United States to keep their secrets. He's a publisher. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. It's what journalists do. Yeah, but, I, you know... It, isn't it isn't it just the case that um, it's a, it's also sending a very strong message to everybody that you know betray our secrets or you know reveal information about us? Um, uh, I'm, I'm, it, I'm, I, I just we'll think kill that you. I get yeah. yeah, and we'll kill you. But I I just think that's the way the world is. You know, that's just not that's always been the way the world is. And he tragically no, no uh, nobody's <laughs> ever tried to prosecute a, a publisher of his. Uh, stature before the Pentagon Papers uh, were uh, the, the the leak of the Pentagon Papers, which revealed the truth about the Vietnam War, were never prosecuted because uh, mm. the government knew that seeking to prosecute someone for publishing the truth was a, yeah. a root of high moral hazard. Yeah. Anyway. Well, I'm going to look into everything that you said, yeah. and thank you. Yeah. Um, you've definitely opened my mind to what, what happened with him. But can I ask you about your um, your attitude towards Hunter Biden? Can yeah. I just... My feeling is that you're kind of playing into Trump's playbook there, that you're kind of, you know, you're kind of jumping on the bandwagon that, you know, this is big, that, you know, that this is um, really happening, that they really did suppress the information about Hunter Biden. And that, but this is just um, like, isn't everything fake news? And can't he? Are, are you not potentially? Well, that's just a different believing? matter. Uh, 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 are you saying that the material on the laptop uh, was fake news, or that the suppression of the story about the laptop 
is fake That's news. That's the thing. Looking into it, uh, first of all, it's hard to know exactly what's going on because hey, they're just investigating and we're hearing that it could have been a Russian disinfo campaign. Uh, not that, and that one again. You know, potentially. Not that yeah, one but again. Who knows, not who big, knows, bad but Boris, who knows? big Bad Boris again. Look, uh, the laptop was recovered from a laptop shop uh, in, I think, New Jersey. That is beyond contradiction. Uh, the material on the laptop uh, was drawn to the attention of Giuliani and co uh, by the man that owned the shop in which the laptop was left for more than a year. And he then published the material that he found on the laptop. And the media then completely suppressed the story. They made it illegal uh, to tell the people what was on the laptop of Hunter Biden. Now, I can't see how anyone could justify that. You might then say, well, the material was fake news. Well, let's prove that. What you can't say is that the material was fake news, therefore we suppressed it. Because now <laughs> none of us can uh, get to grips with the material and decide whether it was fake news or not. Mm. Look, uh, let, me level think, uh, with you. let me level yeah. with you, Brit, in case there's any confusion. I despise Donald Trump and Giuliani and Pence and Graham and uh, uh, all the uh, Republican Party. I despise them. But I also despise Joe Biden and Hunter Biden and Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. I despise yeah. them also. Therefore, I have no uh, dog in this fight. My dog is to know the truth. And if you suppress a story as potentially important as the contents of Hunter Biden's laptop, you are doing the work of tyranny. You are suppressing something that the public had a right to know. Just like Julian Assange and WikiLeaks published all these uncomfortable truths. But we have a right to see uncomfortable truths, Brett. Yes, but um, isn't there, I mean, I, look, this is just my, my absolute um, rage at what uh, Donald Trump has done for the last four years, mm. where he, everything has, he has branded as fake news, where he has absolutely dismissed every single thing. And there is undermined a lot of fake news, though, Brett. The, There is a lot well, of fake news. Well, according, according to Donald Trump, anybody, yeah. Particularly in the United States, there's a lot of fake news. It was fake news that they were invading Iraq because there was weapons of mass destruction. That's quite a, quite a bit of fakery, that. Yeah. So, but, I mean, nothing if, if compares everything... to what Donald Trump has done in well, the last four uh, years. Uh, uh, excuse me. Donald Trump never invaded Iraq and killed a million people. But I accept that. But, I mean, hasn't he undermined... So how, how, why are you saying every... you can't compare? Uh, you're right you can't compare. Trump didn't start but now he's made it any impossible war. For he didn't start any new war. Uh, Barack Obama expanded the war from four countries to nine. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, Brit, I, because you're against mm -hmm. one, doesn't mean you have to be for the other. I'm against them both. No. I'm against well, that's true. the Democrats and the Republicans, Biden and Trump. And if you can bring me a story that I can analyze about either or both, I'll publicize it because the people have a right to know. Yeah. Listen, I, I need to squeeze a last call in. Brid, yeah. it's been okay. great talking to you. Michael in Hove. Two minutes, Michael, go ahead. Uh, good evening, George. Thank you. It's such an honor to be on your show. But Thank you. I just, want to make, I just want to make a point on the drugs thing. Uh, I think drugs should be legalized and even sold, not maybe all of them, and I'll give you my reasons why. One, you can do research into those drugs. MDMA is a uh, sort of uh, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, mushrooms fight depression, the studies on that. Uh, and I think if you do tax them, you can put that into treatment. Imagine all of those Scottish people now who, who are doing heroin, 
not only would they then also have clean heroin needles to, to take and safe places to do it, but then the tax, if they were to buy it and have a clean version of heroin, could then go into re-educating people on the dangers of drugs. And There's no clean version uh, of heroin, Michael. Uh, as, in, as in not cut, as in not cut with bad stuff. I know people that have died of ecstasy or cocaine because it's cut with bad stuff in order for drug dealers to make profit because they yeah, want to put less of the drug in. I, I know that argument. I hear it. We will have another debate on this because we're at the end of the show now. But uh, all I can say is you'll have to go some to persuade me that the state should become a drug dealer. Uh, you'd have to go some... Uh, when arguing for the legalization of prostitution, that the state should become a pimp. Uh, there's moral hazard in both of these courses. There's moral hazard in the current policy we're following. That, of course, I acknowledge. Moreover, our current policy is a miserable failure. But whether we should capitulate and go the whole way to legalization, you'll have to go some to persuade me of that. It's been marvelous for me. I hope it was for you. Come back next week, same time.